Are you getting? Yeah. Sure, why not? Uh, so you, do you guys want to open up our studio? And remember how yesterday we were we transformed our flow set and we saved it? Now we're going to load it so we don't have to retransform it from scratch. What is that transformed? fs.trans or trans.fs.rdata you can find it in the directory and specify the full directory. And you need to start with a clean console. Uh, sure, yes. That would be great. Oh, shoot. What did I do? Um, yeah, I guess this is module 5, so you can open up the R script for module 5. It should already be in there. How to do that. So basically what we're going to do today is we have, we're going to start with the transform data. So remember we pre-processed and got rid of all the debris, margin events, all of that, gated our population of interest in our starting population, so the lymphocytes in this, this particular data set. Um, we did the best we could to exclude all the cells that we don't care about. And then we transformed the channels that needed transformation. So today what we're going to do is actually analyze the data set and try to get something out of it. Um, and we're going to do the, I suppose, discovery uh, route of analysis where we're going to use full type and archaeoptimics to try to come up with what is the phenotype which differentiates the two groups of patients. So in these 20 samples, I have chosen 10 of them which are HIV positive and 10 of, oh sorry, no, sorry, they're all HIV positive. Uh, 10 of them which have a very long survival time and 10 of them which have a very short survival time. Um, and we're going to try to find what the phenotypes which best differentiate between these two groups. As a first step, we're going to gate the uh, live CD3 positive cells using 1D gating, so the flow density that Ryan was just talking about. We're going to do one dimension at a time, we're going to use that. Um, and actually, no, this step we're going to do just like we did yesterday for the debris. We're going to do a pooled flow frame, and then we're going to try to look at what does the CD3 versus the viability channel look like, try to see you know, what the gate should be, and then grab just the CD3 positive live cells. After that, we're going to, in order for us to, to use Archaeoptimics and flow type, we have to first define, give, give, tell it what are the positives and negatives for all of the channels. So we're going to define thresholds for as gates for each and every one of the channels. Um, and we're going to do this again with a pooled frame. We're going to plot it, see what it looks like, and say, okay, it looks like the CD4 gate should be this. But then we're going to actually use flow density to do that exact same step again. But instead of us just looking at the plot and eyeballing, you know, the gate should be 5 or 6 or whatever, we're going to actually use flow density and have flow density define the gate for us and just convince ourselves that it's doing something that we are actually also doing by looking at the data. We're going to visually assess the suitability of the gate, so we're going to just double check that it, it does actually work. And then after that, the second part, after lunchtime, we're going to talk about we're going to do flow type in our characteristics. And that's going to be really hard. So. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's, it's uh, going to be a little computer science-y. Like Ryan said, this is the first version of those last two packages, flow type and our captains. Those are the ones that make those colorful plots that then the really red one, that's your best phenotype. And they look really good for publishing papers. But um, so we're the first of the, of the great unwashed. This is the very first version of them, yeah. Wow. 
but currently they're just finishing up the, the newer version of these packages and once they come out they're actually going to be much easier to use so you guys are going to be super smart and super <laughs> qualified to use the, the newer versions that are easier and actually me teaching you the harder version is going to give you a lot more intuition behind how those those algorithms actually work uh, which is going to help you in interpreting the results so there <laughs> That's my excuse. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the first thing we're going to do is, so today I'm not going to use our studio at all, actually. I'm only going to have the code on the slides, and you guys are going to be running everything. Because you can debug your own issues now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know what you should, be, you, should, you should be seeing, so you don't need to be seeing it on my screen as well. I will have some pictures. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, this very first command here. It re it clears the current workspace. So today you just started up your computer, so you didn't have anything in there. But once in a while, you can do that just to clear all the variables so you didn't accidentally use a yeah. There you go. Uh, graphics off. This again closes up all of your plots that you currently have loaded, and it just gives you a little bit of a speed boost. And now we're going to call, bring in all the libraries that we're going to be working with today. Uh, Flowcore, Flow Density, and GeoMap, which is actually uh, something kind of used by Flow Density for the plotting purposes. When the package is published, it will actually include the GeoMap package within it, so you won't have to do this once it's in the inductor. Then we're going to set our working directory to, again, this is to tell our where our data is going to be stored. And then we're going to load trans.fs.rdata. Print it out just to, to see, you know, that's the thing that we were working with. It has 20 things in it. Um, at this point, if I, if, I, if I was working on this and I haven't worked on it in a while, I would just plot at least one of them and just double check, you know, this is what I think it is, it's the properly transformed one. So feel free to do that. Does everyone have that ready? Like everyone has opened up our studio and loaded in the trans.fs? Yeah, good. And what time is it? Should we take a break now before I start actually doing things? Yes. Okay. If you don't want to take a break, if you would like to continue working, then you can just plot, plot the um, CD3 versus the dump channel, see what it looks like to remind yourself, because that's the thing we're going to be getting first. We're going to get the CD3 positive live cells. A 30 minute break schedule. So stretch your legs, drink the water. Should I press F10? I think that's how you stop it. Okay, so we have our transformed flow set already loaded up and ready to go. We have a plan of what we're going to do with it. And the first step is we're going to gate the CD3 positive live cells. So I'm going to be using the CD3 channel and the dump channel, which is the viability stain and the CD14, whatever thing they want to get rid of. So I don't, I'm not going to be typing out these R780A, V450A over and over and over again. So I'm going to, because I know that's what I'm going to be typing a lot of, I'm going to just set these two variables, C3 and dump, for, for convenience. Does that make sense? So 
We're going to define first the pooled frame again because we have this flow set and we want to try to pick a gate that's going to work for all of them. So I'm going to take a random sample of cells from each and every full frame that I have. And remember the way that you can use this function, get global frame. First, you have to tell R that it should read this file that I've written. So that's what this line does. is calls that file that I had written for you guys. Exactly. No. If you wanted to, so this this function get global frame. If you actually look at it in in this support functions dot r, if you open up that script and scroll down to where the function get global frame is defined, you can see that actually it takes in a flow set. And it takes in one more parameter, but uh, that parameter is optional. There is a default value for it that I automatically calculate for you, or you can set the value. And what that value is, is uh, sort of relative to the average size of a flow frame, how big should my pooled frame be? So in this flow set, each file has about 20,000 cells. The default value is 2. So the pulled frame you're going to get is going to have about 40,000 cells. You can play with that value around if, if you feel like you're, you're not getting a good enough representation and increase that if you want to have 60,000 cells in the pulled frame instead of just 40,000. Or decrease it if you feel like you don't need that many. But uh, because it has the default value, you don't actually have to specify it. And then we're going to plot our pulled frame using the plot dense, the flow density uh, plotting function. And you just give it these two channels like this. And how does it look? Is everybody seeing it? Yeah? I'm not. Oh, I have it. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I haven't looked at this in two days. So I, uh, three days, actually, from the airplane. Um, OK, so the. Yeah. Random. It's a random sample. It's uniform distribution. If you have a hundred cells, it randomly pulls out ten of them. Let's say. So I'm looking at this, and the x-axis is C3. The y-axis is the dump channel. And obviously, I want to gate the ones, these ones, right? This population, where the hand is, so that's the CD3 positive live cells. So I'm just eyeballing it for now, just like yesterday we did. I, I see that the value of 1, remember these are transformed channels, so it's a logical transform. So the value 1 is a transformed value. Does everybody agree with my sort of gating here of what I intend to do? I intend to set the gate on CD3 at 1 and the gate of the dump channel at 1.5. Hmm? You would put it a little closer to? Yeah. Feel free to, to do that. Oh, you did. You, you did. OK. <laughs> Good. 1.2 and 1.3. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's actually one of those things that uh, flow density, the way that it gates is um, basically, like Ryan said, in many different ways. It either finds you know, a nice separation of the two peaks or it uses a standard deviation or a percentile or those track slope things he talked about. And the way that we, uh, one way that we choose which method to use is by talking to you guys and asking you, how do you set your gate? And we need to know how tight do you make it, because that will tell us should we use the uh, two standard deviations or three standard deviations, right? If you want a really tight two standard deviations away from the mean. Okay, so now, so yep. When you, when you do it, do you run the just just once, like the full frame, or you try to different ones? Because it's random, so yeah. So um. What I what would happen is 
if your data set kind of moves around, like each frame is a little, you know, a little bit shifted, um, and you do a pulled frame and you plot it, it's not going to look so nicely separated, right? It's going to kind of look like one population here, you know, it, w it wouldn't be clear for me where the gates should go. If I do it once and it looks very clear to me where the gates should go, I don't need to do it again. <coughs> if it doesn't look very clear, I'm going to actually do it again, but increase my parameter for, uh, let's get more cells and just be more sure okay. that it is possible for me to just set one gate for the whole set. Okay. It may be impossible. In many yeah. cases, it's slightly impossible. Okay, sometimes. sometimes there is enough variation that I don't feel comfortable just using long value. Okay. And I will mention how to address that. Okay. So um, then let's say that you, you pick your values. Feel free to pick your own values. So you don't have to use mine. Um, and let's plot it for, so this, this code here is going to plot it for every single flow frame and just put those values there. And I did not do that. So I will let you guys plot, make this plot and look at it yourselves and tell me what you think about it. Tell me what you think about it. Is it clear what we're plotting here? We did this yesterday, but it is a lot of things. So the first line of code opens up a plot of five rows and four columns because we have 20 samples and I want to plot them all in the same plot so I can get a general overview of what's going on. This second part here, mar, it's the margins around each plot. So the first number, three, means how, how many lines of empty space should be below the plot. Second, the next number three is how many lines of, should, of free space should be around here. The, thir the third number is above, and then the last number is one. So when you plot it, actually, there, there shouldn't be too much space between the next plot here. Because we don't have a legend here, any kind of access labeling, so we don't need that much space. And this third one is just brings the, the labels a little bit closer up to the axis. It's just for saving space on our plotting region. If you do question mark par, whenever you get to the point where you've done something and it looks really good and you really want to save that plot, but you really want to make it pretty and you want to adjust your you know, sizes of your labels and things like this, do question mark par and go through that. And it has some really, really cool options for, for making or improving how your plot looks. So that's the first line, it just prepares it. And then this for loop, because I want to plot every one of them, I'm going to cycle through one to the length of the uh, flow set. That's going to be 20, right? But that I don't necessarily know that. So I, instead of putting 20, I've put the length of trans.fs. It's always best to, even if you know that it's 20, it's always best to just leave it as something more generalizable, right? Because what if you want to reuse your code and you read in a new flow set that's 30 and you forget that you had that 20 hard coded in there? That happens a lot. You forget that something's hard coded and you're wondering why is it not doing that? <laughs> what I what I expect. Then the first line within the loop uses the plot density, it plots the this is this takes the ith frame inside the flow set. And it plots it for these two channels, CD3 and dump. And it draws these two lines. Remember, V means vertical line, H means horizontal line. And line width equals two means make the lines a little bit thicker than normally. And blue. Any questions about this? For transformation. Uh, hmm? This is the transform both What's the transformation? The one that we did yesterday. Yesterday, when we pre-processed or removed all the debris and stuff, and then we transformed, we saved trans.fs. No, it was uh, logical, I think. Yeah. So everyone's okay with this? Everyone got the plot? Okay, and looks fairly good. I mean, it's not perfect, but... F yeah, that's what it's it's kind of reassuring that you know what what we experience on day to day basis is this variation because your voltage is always going to be a little bit different as you fiddle with the one day to day. Yep. 
that's true. Okay, so we have decided that we were fairly satisfied with our gating strategy according to how we've visualized it. So now we actually have to apply. Just plotting it doesn't make it so, right? You, you have to actually uh, remove those cells and just retain only the CD3 positive viable cells. And so we're going to do that exactly the same way that we removed the debris before, where remember how you set a threshold for forward scatter, you took the cells that were less than that threshold, and you set a side scatter, you took the cells that were less than that threshold, you intersected them, and those were your cells. So we're, we're doing exactly the same thing. So, but remember how we used a for loop for that, and then, you know, within the for loop, for each flow frame, we did this, and that's a little bit slow for um, running time, computational time. So instead, because this is something that we apply to each and every flow frame, we're going to actually try using FS apply this time. Remember FS apply? It's a function that applies a function to each flow frame of a flow set object. For example, the function n row. Remember the function n row when you give it a flow frame, so just one of the flow set things, not the whole flow set, but just one. n row of a flow frame gives you the number of cells you have in that flow frame. If you do fs apply, and then you give it the flow set, comma, n row. It's going to take that function and row that you put in there and apply it on each and every one of the frames inside the flow set. And it's going to give you, you know, flow frame one has this many cells. The second one has this many, this many, this many. And that's just one line of code. But it does, like, all these things. We're going to try to use the same idea here. And what, what is the, f so the function there was n row. That's the function that we were applying to the flow set. What is our function here? Our function is gate the CD3 live cells. But there is no built-in function for that. So we have to write our own function now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just like, um, you know that function we use for the pooled frame, get global frame? That's a function I wrote somewhere else. So that then you guys can just reuse it. Every time you want to get a pulled frame, you just call that function. You don't have to type it out, the whole thing that I have typed out for you before. So you're going to experience a lot of things where you're analyzing your flow data, and a lot of your steps are very similar. You don't want to be typing it out every single time or you know, have this long code and try to change indices or names or whatever every time. So you're, you should learn how to create your own functionality that you, for your experiments, find useful. In this case, I will find it useful to gate the live CD3 positive cells. In your case, you might find some other common thing that you do that you find very useful. Maybe you can write your own function for a custom debris removal of your type of data. So how do you go about writing a function? We want a function which does something to a single flow frame, right? Because then we're going to apply that to the whole flow set. So let's just start with a single flow frame and design our steps that we want to apply to this one flow frame and just write the code for one flow frame. Then we're going to make that into a function that R recognizes as a thing that it should run that same code. So let's just for now focus on one flow frame. This is how we're going to remove the dead cells and the CD3 negative cells, or rather retain only the CD3 positive live cells. Let's just start, for example, take the very first flow frame, call it F. We're going to first do what? Find, this, for example, the CD3 positive indices. Which of these cells are CD3 positive? Well, those are just which the expression values of F in the CD3 channel are greater than 1 or whatever your gate was, 1.2, whatever your type gate was. Does that make sense? Does that one line of code make sense so far? OK. So that, so that gives you all the indices of the cells that are you know, beyond the C3 threshold. Then we're going to find the other cells, of the, the other indices of interest, which are the dump channel negative cells. And again, that's very similar. Which of the express of f, so the expression values of f in the dump channel, are less than 
whatever gate you decided, 1.3 or whatever, and combine them by using the intersection of these sets of indices, and that will give you the little, you know, quadrant of that we're, that we're actually interested in. And then the way that you subset, the way that you just take those cells, we, we can put those into the final result that we want, viable.f equals f, and then you just subset the indices. You could have uh, instead found the, the, the CD3 negative cells and then taken the union of the CD3 negative cells and the dead cells and then subtracted those. Right, so that doesn't matter. You do it whatever makes the most sense to you. I have chosen to done it, you know, in this way, but you could have done it the other way and subtracted the unwanted cells instead of retaining only the, those cells we're interested in. So does this make sense? So if you want to write a function that's going to repeat a process for each flow frame, the first thing you do is figure out, well, how do I do this thing that I want to do for the one flow frame? So this is your very first step. You're going to do this, write this code, and then make sure that it works before you try to abstract it into making it some function that later you call. So you have to first make sure that the thing you're going to put in your function actually works. And so let's make sure that it works. So here's the, the plotting steps. You plot the expression of f. So I have used this, this other so there's actually, I guess I have plotted in a couple of different ways. Here I have the plot dense um, version. So first you plot it. The, the, remember F is not altered. F is the one that we, it's just the transformed one. It's not the one with, that we have gated. Viable.f is the one that we actually gated. So first you plot F and then use the points function to overtop of that in green color, point, uh, plot the cells of interest. Did everybody get that? Does everybody see, you know, is it legitimate what we're plotting? Is it legitimate what our function is doing? Is doing what you expected? Sometimes when you're writing the, the, this kind of function, if it's doing something more more involved than what we just did, you might see something when you, when you try to validate your function is working right. You might see like you've accidentally all the cells are green or something, so you must have gone had a typo in your code or done something wrong. So always, always make sure that you, your function is doing what you expect it to do before you use it on your whole entire flow set. So I didn't include it here, but there is a way, did I include it in the virtual box, the plot, this, yeah? No? Did I include in the code, sorry? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I did. Okay. So, yeah, I basically just, uh, it's the convex hull of the points that are within that region. When you go to question mark C hull, it, it's, uh, you can see sort of what that function does. It's explained, and then if you scroll down to the end, it gives you an example. What I find the most useful when I'm trying to, um, if I'm reading someone else's code and I don't know what this function is, you know, how do they do that? What does that mean? How do they even get that? You know, how am I supposed to know that? I have no idea where they, you know, where they got that. I I read sort of the header of the help function to get a gist of what the function is doing or what it's about, and then I quickly scroll down to the bottom <laughs> and find the example section. Look at the example, and, and the example section, usually they have some code that you can actually execute yourself and see what the code does. Step by step, you will see, okay, so in the example, they first load this data, and then they plot the points. That, I get that, and then they run this function, and then what does that do? Oh, there's what it does. You just run the code, and you see that, oh, that's the code that places the gate around. So... Um, yeah, if you're not comfortable with just copying my code, which you shouldn't be, look through the example of that help file. It's it's one of the best ways to learn just by, by example. And I mean, obviously, read the description and it will help you sort of understand, but it won't really click until you run the example. 
So every, is everyone okay with that? Convex hull is when you have a, a bunch of points and you want to find, you want to place a gate that is as tight as possible but encapsulates all points. So, oh, okay. so, so yeah, yeah, but every single dot. So the reason why the gate is not very tight looking is because there's, you know, like one dot here, there's like one dot here, there's no dots here, so that's why I just kind of cut across this line, like so. The square and it just reduces to whatever exactly, exactly, uh, the, the best it can, yep. So it, this is how I would plot, try to like replicate a gate plot, gated plot. It's not going to look super satisfying to biologists because they're going to think, you know, why did you go up that far and like this? And it's just because there's a few dots there that probably don't make a huge difference if you include or exclude them. And like like uh, Craig was saying, you know, it's if your if your gate is tighter, it probably will look more uh, comparable to a, a manual gate. So you define gate 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 dot points with this new function child, but then you redefine it. So what what the function it. does is actually it will give me the indices of where these lines should go, sort of like all these points that surround my points, except for it doesn't connect the last one. So what I have done is I have actually given all of these points that are the coordinates of where how it should draw the R should draw the line. I have also appended to the very end of it the first point where it started so that it will close the gate. And the first point where it started is gate gate stop PTS square brackets one square brackets. Exactly. You can print out some of these things and see what they actually are and see what is the first thing and does it make sense. <clears throat> Is this okay then? And my gate's a little fractionally tighter because your yours look better than no, mine. No, no, I'm not saying it's I'm okay. Not you saying can better. say they're better. I'm not saying better, but because I define yep. the viable gate. Can I when see? I, I'm I curious. Back, when I, when I changed. I changed the numbers when, yeah, when yeah, we're looking yeah. at indices. Yeah. Which, which cells are greater than one point two instead of one? Which yeah, so so the reason why it goes like that instead yeah. of just like that is because there's probably like one point there or something. Yeah. That, that's why it doesn't look quite as satisfying, you know, yeah. as you manually would do it, but it is the same thing. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, that's functionally the same thing. Yeah, you could, have, you could have said anything is greater than zero. Right. Yeah. So is everyone okay with this? plot so far, yeah? So remember, if you're, if you're reading this later and you forgot what was going on, just do the question marks, you know, see it all and see. You know, go over the example. And just, just more stupid questions. When, we, when we're drawing the lines for the variable x, the subset gate stop points, why is the gap to, to points to comma and then nothing after the comma? Why is there nothing there? Oh, that's the. Um, it's it's the matrix. It's a matrix, so I'm only taking those indices and all columns. And the only two columns I have in there are the CD3 and the dump channel. Right. So I'm only taking the, the rows. Right. There's no no stupid question. <laughs> there are some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Okay. I mean, so what have we done? We have written some code that does the thing we want to do on a single flow frame. We have verified that indeed the way that we composed our algorithm is valid it does what we expect it to do we're happy with it now we want to go and put it into a function 
that we will never have to write this code ever again. We'll just call it, right, as a function. And so this is how you write a function. Um, first, you name it something. Let's name it get viable frame. Yeah. How does, how does I don't know it's a function? By putting this arrow here and then saying and then function. The function. And by convention, you do this little thing where you put the capital letters in the middle of the name. Yes, that's just for readability. That's, that's convention. Yeah. 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 Some people use the convention where they put underscores between or dots or whatever, but this is the best way because it avoids any of those special characters. Yeah, and, and by convention, the first letter is small because it's not that important. Like, there's more important things in R that should be capitalized. <laughs> Your little function. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That, it's just a, com it's yeah, a sure. convention. <laughs> but the word function kind of thing is that hard to dictate that this Yeah, yeah, no, I see that now. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, uh, you know, when you're, yeah, when you're defining, you know, a, a vector or a matrix or a list, you would say list something, yeah. your data. But this is a function, so it's more special than, than those things. And the way that you activate this function, the way that R is not going to, like, start now making this use usable is you just execute this whole chunk of code. R is not going to do anything. It's just going to read it and be like, OK, from now on, when you say get viable frame, I'm going to know where the, what to do. I'm going to do these things that you're saying. So, um, so, so you, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what it is. So the, the, so you get, give it a name, and then you say this is a function of and then this is your input variable. This is the thing you expect people to give to you. In our case, it's going to be a flow frame. And you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter at all. You can call it x. You can call it a. You can call it flow frame. Don't call it flow frame. That's a reserved word. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, also, don't name your function something that you know already is a function. Like, don't name this, you know, transform. <laughs> There's already a transform, right? You don't want to, because if you do name a transform and then you execute that, you have deleted the previous one. So there's a bit of competition in the A bit of competition. To, to actually there's the actually sometimes, uh, I have used some old versions of some packages where someone didn't quite think hard enough about their naming stuff. So I would load flow core, and then I would load this other package. And this other package has these functions that replace some of the like core functionality of flow core. And so I, funny things would happen when I run my old code, and I wouldn't figure out why until I realized, OK, it's because I load these, this package that it deletes some of the functions that I relied on previously. So just don't, try to name it something you know, more very specific to what you're doing, not some generic term that probably exists. OK, so that, this is the first line, is you, you give it a name. You say that it's a function of some variable that you're going to be working with within. And you open a curly bracket. You write your functionality here, and you close the curly bracket. So here's the functionality. Whatever you give to the function, that's going to be our f now. Remember here when we were just practicing our algorithm, we said f is going to be the very first flow frame just for practice purposes. Now, your f is going to be whatever the person calling the function sends you. So f is going to be something given to the function. So we, we don't have an f definition inside. So once we have our f, we do the same things as before. We define our CD3 positive indices greater than 1, the, the dump channel indices less than 1.5, combined, subset. The viable frame is going to be now the, the subsetted frame that was given to you. And then you have to return the viable f. So when I call my function, I will give it a flow frame. And what I want to get back is just the viable cells, viable C3 positive cells. Right? That's, that's, why, that's what we return, because that's what we want to get back. When you call a, fun a different function, such as um, 
get global frame. You give it a full set, but in return you get a full frame, right? That's what I my function returned to you. Was you know I do some stuff with the full set that you've given me, and then I create this full frame and I return that full frame to the function call. Does this make sense? Now, if you just select that code and run it, execute it, so that you know R will read it and know that okay, now we're gonna. Every time you say get viable frame, I, I'm gonna know what to do. Now let's uh, try what we did before with the same full frame f that we. You remember this one where we well it was the trans.fs the first one, the one that we used to practice and we lo wrote these like five lines of code basically for. Now we can do the exact same thing but just in one line of code and just get viable frame f. And then you can, why don't you just play around with that for a minute? And, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I put code in there to plot it again. Yeah, OK. Plot it again and make sure that it's the same thing that we had before, just now in one line of code instead. So why did I, so it seems like you know, I have replaced, uh, you know, I had five lines of code before that did this. Now it's one line of code, but really I also had to write these like seven lines of code above to define this function. So how does that really save me any anything, right? I can reuse it again. That's that's true. That's one benefit. Another benefit is I would take this out of my script, my analysis script, and I would put it in a separate analysis script, just like I have my support functions .r. I have a bunch of little functions defined in there. And I'm not, they're not inside of my main analysis script where if, if they were, I would have like a thousand lines of code to do the analysis of one data set. But because I'm calling them from this other script, then my, my code looks really nice. Read.fcs, transform.fcs, whatever. Get global frame, get viable frame, plot frame, done. So your code becomes more readable the more you separate your the functionality into sort of different modularize them basically you know the, define little functions that even just five lines of code if you take it out it will just I mean it doesn't just look much better when someone's reading your code and trying to figure out what what were you doing they don't have to figure out okay what is he doing here he's getting the CD3 indices and then he's getting this and then he's getting that and combining them and subsetting them oh no he's just getting the viable cells so also another point make sure your function names are informative of what it is you're doing don't call it function one or f1 or anything like that because <laughs> that's no good it also helps a lot the maintainability because when you're doing the same thing over and over and over again Using a lot of scripts, but, and then when you're down the road, you find you made a mistake, and you're not that this will happen, but you may have a bug in your code, and, and then you don't want to have to go back and fix that in every bitter code that you wrote on all your different assays for the last next months. So you just have to fix it in that one spot. Yeah, and re execute your code. Because you will find bugs until so the computer. You might um, not if you don't look back now. <laughs> you might yeah, never find them. <laughs> if you're doing, so one of the rules that I have about stuff, if you're doing stuff more than once, then you try and automate that as much as you can, right? And so using the same bit of code again and again, the more you do functions, and then put that aside, you have less repetition, and three times repeat stuff, the easier it is to get out of problems later. Does that make sense? So is everyone okay with writing their own functions now? You guys are, I see the things now. Yeah, 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 it seems like they're all pros. No. As long as I can no. just copy your code, it's fine. <laughs> I have yeah. a real question about um, when we use points to plot up our CD3 positive function or negative points. I'm not, I'm, I'm not seeing much. I'm not seeing my points plotted over my. I'm not seeing a bunch of little dots representing. I'm what I'm Let's see. Up here, 
as a combination of that, which is So you probably, yeah, exactly. Probably got rid of everything on the other side of. It. So, so a good good point. If you're plotting something and you're not seeing what you expect to see, and you know, rerun it from the start, remove all the variables, start it again. Still, it's not showing up what you think you should be seeing. What are some ways that you can try to debug what the identify what the issue is? Is it really our studio that's not plotting what it should be plotting, or is it maybe one of your things you're trying to plot? You had a bug somewhere earlier, and it's not what it should be. So, for example, she was trying to plot issues here. She plotted these dots here. You know, they were black, and then over top she tried to plot the green ones, but they weren't showing up for some reason. So she checked, well, n row of viable dot f for example, and it was zero cells. So it wasn't that our studio wasn't showing up the green points, it was that there were no points in the frame. So obviously above like one of her less than or greater than signs is probably the wrong way. So that's just something to keep in mind when it's not doing what you expected, which is going to happen way more often than it never works from the first try, ever. Is right? it magic now? Huh? Now we well, now that you have your function, you know, it's <laughs> that you've tested your function, you've made sure that it's going to work, it, it will not happen, but it, it will happen occasionally, and there's, you're yeah, going to so be... When I, when I do, when I used to do a lot of coding. When was that? <laughs> I don't know much coding. So when I used to coding, I, I print statements all the time, so when, whenever you have a bunch of functions that are doing stuff, and putting variables and other things, you just always put print, this checks, especially when you're writing code the first time, so you have a bunch of questions that are when you have a bunch of um, functions that are taking stuff and translating that, taking that, what was in that, and then doing something else, you're like doing all these steps. Just the print statement to show what's actually in that thing, but if, if there's one way you get around these problems like this. So you're always doing visual checks to see that what, there is something in that that's within, within the range that you expect. What, what can you do here to, to address that issue? For example, um, let's say uh, that you want to just make sure that you are subsetting this correctly. One thing you can do is before you return, you can add here print, open bracket, n row, viable.f, and then close the bracket. What's going what's gonna to happen there is every time that you call that function, once it does its little subsetting of the CD3 positive viable cells and you know it does this, then it's going to print the number of cells that are inside of that frame just before it returns it to you. And so if you see a zero there, that should be telling you, oh, why is it not finding any CD3 positive viable cells? Something's, I might be doing, there might be a bug in my function, or maybe the frame that I passed to it already didn't have any cells in it. So that's one place where you could add a print. Yeah, it's really smart, because the next thing that happens, you start ignoring all these print statements that you wrote, because everything's working. <laughs> Then you start putting checks in. So if you think that there should be, if you're doing some, if you're doing a function that's supposed to return some viable cells, you should, you're expecting that that's going to return a number of cells greater than zero. So you know you wrote, you wrote, wrote the code 20 times, you get tired of seeing that zero all the time. And you realize, oh, all, all I'm doing is checking to see if it's if there's viable cells in there. Then you do it like an if statement, statement. and you, you check to say, well, I'm expecting there to be. If you're always expecting there to be some viable cell return, then you better check to see that actually happened. And so you, you do a check to see if the number of viable cells is greater than zero. If it's not, then you do error, 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 and put that on the screen with yeah. the lights. And that way you get a warning that something's not happening. Yeah, yeah I usually, usually print out error in capital letters with a bunch of exclamation points after it that go over a bunch of lines so that I'll see it on my screen. I won't just ignore it. It won't look like a thing that you normally see. And then you have a robot. Yeah. So this is all about like good encoding. This is no matter what coding language you're learning, you'll be learning these tricks over and above just learning how to do stuff for, for flow. So now, now that you know how to do flow 
power stuff, array <coughs> coding, things like that. It's just some yeah, you can be pro now you're programmers. You can't really do anything now. <coughs> so you know that I figured out why. Wait, is it working? Because I have no events. Yeah. It's really not me. I'm looking at the CD3 positive index, which is defined as take anything <coughs> from <it> out. <coughs> Where the CD3 row is greater than one, which is it's very end of the code. Okay, fine. I'll execute that, and then I'll just say uh, CD3 popular. Show I just wrote in that index name and hit the enter button <coughs> because, like we're saying, I'm, I'm looking to see that which I just defined. And when I ask for uh, when I ask for a row, when I ask for events that were greater than one for CD3, I get a responsive integer parentheses zero. So that means that it did not find any cells that were greater than one. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So your original flow frame does it have any cells in it? My original. Flow so frame. your f, not your viable f, but your f. Yeah. No, I've got like seventeen, a little bit more than. Can you plot it seven. and make plot the CD three versus dump channel and make sure that you have cells over over one? <coughs> Maybe your transformation from yesterday was fudged. In which case, you'd, I would suggest that you open up the module three code mm -hmm. and just run the whole thing and make sure that your trans.fs is saved properly. Because I can see with I, I can see all of my events that I just. Would um, well, you do plot dense of mm -hmm. f, comma, and concatenate the cd three comma dump channel to see what it looks like and make sure that it's on the same scale that I was looking at. You know that there are cells over one. Okay. So everyone's comfortable with the function, and everyone's comfortable with how we use the function. You just call it, you know, just like we did get global frame. You know, you give it the thing that it takes as input, and so what we might do is it's a function. If we might copy that. So open a new script, paste that into that new script, save that new script as get by the frame dot mm -hmm. as a new script. You can, yeah. And then, then we wanted to use it in our oh. meta script. Yeah. We, we would we would source yes. from this directory get by the frame dot r. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what you're doing. You can do that. I think I'm starting to understand something. You can even do that if you want. Why don't you do that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm already putting together a pretty Okay. Oh, of, of, wow. of functions and stuff. Oh, look at you. Maybe you can share that with the class. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, now that we have this function, we can just apply. We can get. We can. We don't have to do it one frame at a time anymore. We can just use fs apply, which. To, takes a flow set and applies a function to it, to each one of its entries, so to each one of the flow frames. If this applies a function, that's part of flow pool. Yes, yeah. It's a built-in thing. I didn't write that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Remember how we did n row here instead before, and it just gave us a list of all the numbers of cells that are in the each flow frame? Well, now we can just get Put another function in there instead. I have a question. Um, in the plots uh, area, like when you, when you when you draw plots or do that, uh, do a for loop and then and, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems limited in, in your field of view. Like you can't scroll and I mean, it squishes everything into one. That's our studio. Yeah. But I because it's the same thing, does it? Yeah, yes. So there is uh there is something you can do where um so I never I rarely plot things just like in such a large scale, you know, twenty things on one plot just to look at it on my screen. Um but you can actually write uh, an image file to your computer system directly and give it the dimensions you wanted the picture to be. So maybe you want it to be really long and narrow or a huge thing, and then I look at that. 
I opened that up. So uh, we will do that later. Um, we will do that later. Yeah. But yeah, with in, in R, if you're just using a terminal and a window pops up, you can resize that window, right? Even in R Studio, you can resize it, but because it's all such a limited region. So this is how we FS apply, right? Apply the function. Is everyone okay with that? Really? Let me let me take a look at. I guess so. Yeah, let me just take a Did you save anywhere the um, What's, what's your email address? I'll email you. There it is. There it is. So it must not be a Yeah, once you get it, just run everything up until the point we're at. So when we execute this line, fs apply, you give it the flow set that you're starting with, so the trans.fs. You give it the function name that you wanted to apply, and you make sure that this function is such that it takes in a single flow frame. And then it just stores all the return flow frame, and it, re and it returns a single flow frame, and then that way it becomes a flow set. So now viable.fs, you can print it out to your screen, you know, viable.fs, enter, and just see, make sure it's just 20 flow frame objects inside of it. It just, it just um, printed it out automatically. So, uh, right around, uh, if it's a blood trans dot if it's get on the phone it's from speed out on that. Uh can I see your function? Where you find it? Oh yeah, maybe I'll put print some. Oh, yeah, there you go. Very good. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> something that I didn't read. <laughs> Although yeah, okay. So um, now that now that we have this, now that we have this flow set, um, we can sort of examine it a little bit. So we can, um, if you do fs apply viable.fs and row, that gives you the number of cells in each of the flow frames of the viable flow set, right? I'm dividing that by fs apply trans.fs and row. That second part gives me the number of cells that were in the flow set before I just took the CD3 positive viable cells. So these live counts are actually proportions of live CD3 positive cells that I have. If you're not sure how quite this quite works, Copy just this fs apply viable.fs, comma, and row, just that part, and print it out on your screen. See, like, just run it in your console and see what that gives you. And then you can copy the second piece and print that out on your screen and see what that gives you, and then convince yourself that it is what, what it, it is the live proportions. Thank you.
I'll go to your other box when you're ready to do it. Or try to refresh. Go to your normal computer on the virtual box and try. Is your internet working? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not, not within the box. Can I access? Well, it's not if you anything. can access it, you can actually drag and drop it to your new box and folder. It's okay, so I can. Um, yeah, I mean, so you're saying from my computer, right? So does everybody have the live counts? And plotted the next line plots the density of the life counts. Does it make sense what those life counts are? Yeah. They're proportions of like the um, basically what percentage? Like if you were opening this in FlowJo and you put this gate here and it will give you like thirty percent or something like that. That's exactly what it is. I was about to. When you have two vectors of the same size, um, it knows to divide element-wise. Yeah, that's how R works. That's not necessarily how other packages work or other programs work, but that's what R does by default. That you did what? I did this program thing, so that's why it doesn't look like it. Yeah, play around with it. Plot, plot the histogram as well as the density. See which one you, you find more informative. Uh, remember in the histogram you can also put comma and then some number and that will tell it how many little bars to plot. How to what? Oh, I just that was like some really bad yeah. yeah. I was looking at the numbers and it seems to be if you can define the the bits of something better. Yeah, it's better to yeah, specify. Yeah. 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 You know what? Just put yeah. source. It will run everything for you. Since there's some error, of course. If you want, you can just get down from the thing and just put that on the other one. Because it will be added to the yeah. there, right? Yeah, just download the one from the And when you put source. So, when you guys are uh, in our studio, you know how you can run execute line by line by pressing Control Enter? or by selecting the line and pressing run, or selecting a section and pressing run. If you click source at the top there, we'll just run everything in that script that you have open. 
So if you wanted to rerun your code from scratch because you think you maybe reran one line a couple times extra, then you can just source. Suzanne Marshall is going. <laughs> Someone's sending me spam. That's really like it. Really like Window where your virtual box is open. No. Um, where is your menu? Like I have this menu. I'm, I'm learning. Let me show you because I I don't. Like this is my window where my virtual box is. Right. I have this yeah. menu here. Yeah. Devices. Do you have something like that? Somewhere in the window where your virtual box is running. Uh, yeah, I mean, I go back to. So I've got the buses to find the virtual box. Yeah, the virtual box. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I can store this in that. Oh, you probably want to eject it from your regular computer. Yeah. So what happens when you plot the density of these live counts? It just so shows you throughout your full set how, you know, what kind of per live percentages you're working with, or what kind of C3 live percent positive percentages you're working with. And it looks like there's two peaks, right? Does it? 
look like you have two peaks. There's like so a little dip in between them. So whenever you see two peaks, that kind of looks like you have two groups, right? Maybe you can separate them somehow. So maybe even just these live counts, live CD3 positive counts could be enough to separate your data well enough. Who knows? We would need to have some kind of p-value to evaluate that more precisely or even to make sure that it's not just, it just so happens there's some of them have a lower count, some of them have a higher, but it has nothing to do with the survival time. So on that note, maybe now it's time that we actually take advantage of the survival data that we have. So like I said, these 20 patients, um, I took 10 that had very low survival times and 10 that had fairly high survival times. The whole data set had 466 patients, so I just picked 10 of the one kind and 10 of the other kind, basically. So, in normally, you would read in an Excel spreadsheet that has all the clinical information and you know all the survival times for each of the patients. In this data set, it just so happens that that information is already inside of the FCS files. So, if you recall, we were scrolling through the description of the flow frame and it had this thing there, CD survival time from zero conversion. I don't know if you recall that from yesterday. And it had the number of days of survival. Survival before either the patient progressed to AIDS or died. So how do we get all that information from the whole flow set. We want to know the survival time for each patient. Well, this because... It's a very complex line of code. It's inception. It's inception. This is <laughs> for inception. sure. Yes. Remember how with FS apply, we put in a flow set, okay? And then we put in a function, right? Okay, no, no, I have... the function inside. Yes. You know how when you plot the expression of f, you can either first define a matrix E equals the expression of f, and then you plot E. Or you can plot the expression of f. So you can kind of save yourself some, some code if you just write it within one line. You don't have to, but you can. And in this case, if you were to write a special function and save it in a different file and source it so that you can call it, it would just be a one-line function. It's not a five-line function like we did earlier. It's a one-line function. So for that reason, you can actually just put it directly in there. So what we're doing in generating is a new matrix that has the data from the Bible going at this matrix flow set. And we're adding We're aligning another matrix. We're aligning a one-line matrix from the. It's not a matrix. It's, it's a. Remember uh, when you do a flow frame, at description, it gives you all those gibberish things with all the keywords. I'm actually actually accessing only one of those keywords, the one that was called CD survival time from zero conversion, and that is all that this function does. It's just. It takes in a flow frame. Why is this a flow frame? Because I'm applying this to a flow set. And FS apply takes a flow set, and then whatever comes next, it applies that to just each frame one at a time. So, so far, don't look at this, just look at this part. Just FS apply, viable FS. I'm going to apply to this flow set something to each flow frame one at a time. So from here on, from from this comma on, whatever I put is only going to be really applying to one flow frame at a so, time. So you could generate another, another matrix. You know, this matrix is going to be survival, but you could have another date. Yeah. Yes. And then you could just replace this with the date. Yeah. And that is what I would do if I were wanting to check my that my controls were obtained, acquired on the same day as mine non-controls. <laughs> Make sure I'm using the correct control. So this this function here 
it's just a local definition. I'm never going to be reusing it again because it's only alive in this bracket here of, of this line of code in my code. I'm never going to be calling this function again. That's why it doesn't have a name. It has no name. Could you just take the two weeks to put the at description all the time inside the brackets? Unfortunately, no. But um, <laughs> because the ads is just a symbol, right? If, if it was a symbol in the uh, shit itself. Yeah. That, that is exactly the, the only reason why I have to do this complicated thing where I write function x and x at. Because I can't just put at this. You know how when I did n row, I did n row of x? n row of, like I put the brackets, I'm not doing that with the at symbol. It's a different type of game at all, but completely. So because of that, I have to do, do it like this. Don't worry about it too much. Just know that if you needed to access one of those things that you get with the at symbol, you would have to do it like this. That is all you need to learn. But you will see this. That's why I'm, sh I'm not trying to confuse you and, you know, teach you things that you will never see. You, I will never ask you to do that. You, you will never be forced to do this. There's other ways of getting this information. But you will see this. So I just wanted to demonstrate. It's not, don't worry too much about trying to be able to do it from scratch on your own or anything like that. Just know that... It's just one way of defining a function that you're only going to be using this one time, so you don't need to write a separate script file and source that. You can just define it on the fly. So function needs to have something in the brackets. And you call that, yeah. that something x. And whatever you call it, the, you're going to be using that variable name for the actual things the function does. If I put f here, I would have an f here. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And that won't be uh, that won't affect my f from like the previous screens. It will not affect this f at all. It's just a temporary variable, just for the function's purposes of knowing how, what you're doing to the thing that I gave you. So. Just when you run this one line of code, you see sir, you, you can print out survival to the screen. Just this line. Don't run the next line yet. Just run this one. And what what does it look like when you print survival to the screen? Before you run as a merit. Yeah, it's a matrix. But yeah, right. It's a matrix and the name of the CS file and then one column with the multiple days of and do you see how the days are in quotation marks? They're in quotation marks, right? Yes. The number of days. Those are actually not numbers, right? Uh, because, you know, someone entered those of the flow cytometer. Uh, you know, R isn't smart enough to know that those should be numbers. Maybe they shouldn't be numbers. Maybe they should be strings, you know. Maybe they're a patient ID number. It's not a numerical number that I should be adding and multiplying. It's just a label. So when I run the next line, which says as numeric, it basically forces this to be a vector of numbers. So now it's turning it into something I can actually plot, I can add, I can multiply. So that's why I have this, this line of code here. Uh, so you can do you can do question mark as numeric or question mark numeric, and it will it will tell you about that, and then it will probably say um, towards the end of the help it will say see also or also see the following search terms that will be so there's as character, which is if you had numbers but really you didn't want them to be numbers, you wanted them to be words, you don't want someone to accidentally try and add them to something or multiply them, then you can convert convert them to char a character vector. So, 
an integers one two three a number is one point two yeah absolutely yeah um I left ahead and converted this file to the numeric so I've gone back and called it another variable survival x and da 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 but it's still false fine even though it's a matrix uh so, oh, but is it so? Yeah, no, it's not in, in, it's still, it's still a matrix with the... Uh, yeah, okay. It's, it's not floating. Yeah, it's floating. Oh, sorry, I changed the characters. Oh, okay. To, to convince <laughs> myself. Couldn't see it. To convince myself. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, I'm going to change the characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does work. So, so in this case, so, it is maybe so smart I, enough. But so I was waiting for I was wanting to see what the error message was going to be. Oh it yeah. Me, but it didn't. But for once, our studio was actually smart enough to do it. Yeah, it's possible. In certain cases, maybe uh, if you're trying to do a fancier plot, maybe it won't do it. Like I don't know if you try to do a density plot or Instagram, but maybe then it will fail. It will fail at some point. Um, you shouldn't be trying to plot words ever. <laughs> Even if those words happen to be numbers uh, to you. <laughs> so, is everyone clear on what this, what this plot is? The x axis is the survival time, and the y axis is life counts. What am I plotting exactly? So, for example, this dot here, this patient survived 2,000 days. And they have about 20% of uh, CD3 positive live cell proportion. Does that make sense? That's what I'm plotting. So, when I look at this, you know, to me, it kind of looks like there's very, very few samples that I've plotted. I can't really see too much, but you know, if we're trying to make it interesting for you guys, there seems to be a little bit more of these people that don't survive very long and also happen to have fairly low live CD3 positive proportions. And then there's a little bit more of the higher survival people, and they also tend to have higher proportions of CD3 positive live cells. Maybe this is a biologically irrelevant thing that I'm plotting. Maybe probably what you're thinking is I shouldn't be plotting the proportion CD3 positive live cells, I should just be plotting the CD3 positive cells out of the live, right? I shouldn't be taking it out, of, including the dead cells in this at all, which I am by, by defining my proportion like this. But just for illustration purposes, let's assume it's somehow useful. So this is, a, this is sort of like a, an exploratory data analysis thing. You just visualize your data and try to see is there a pattern here or not. If you see some kind of a pattern, like perhaps this is a pattern, if you had way more samples, you would see it more clearly. Um, then from this, you could get an idea about maybe doing some kind of p-value type thing, you know, associating a p-value with it so that you can demonstrate it's statistically significant. But as a first step, just plot it and see if, see what it looks like. Maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not. If all the dots were just all over the place, it would definitely not be very interesting as a first step. So I decided not to go into detail about k-means, um, just because it would be, I think, too much information. Um, what is k-means? Has anybody heard it before other than today when Ryan said it? Yeah? Just you have an idea of what it is. Say it's a, I heard it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a clustering yeah. method. What's a clustering method? Is it? Everyone's heard that obviously. And clustering is just, you know, you have the intuitive understanding. It's It tries to group together the cells that are somehow close to each other into one cluster and then another group of cells in another cluster. It doesn't have to be cells, it could be anything. It could be patients. It tries to group patients that are similar to each other based on some criteria such as CD3 live proportions. Close to, if, if they're similar to each other, it's going to cluster them into the same group. 
versus other patients that seem to have different types, very, very different from that first group's live cell CD3 counts. That's what clustering is, it's the grouping. It's a, a method to group like things together. K-means is one clustering method, one sort of approach to uh, clustering. And what it does is literally take, I mean, there's, there's different ways you can define distance here, but it kind of takes the Euclidean distance, like the distance from this point to this point, like all of these points are really closest to each other, and these, these points kind of are closer to, to each other. So if you ask K-means, give me two clusters. This is what, I, this, is what this line does. K-means, here's my data. My data is just live counts. Can you break those into two clusters for me? That's what this one does. <coughs> Using just literally, if you have a bunch of dots here and a bunch of dots here, it's going to say these are one cluster, these are another cluster. We have some dots that are kind of like this, so it, it, it just kind of splits it in half. Maybe it's not very logical how it does it, but just it was asked it to split it in half, so here it is, it splits it in half. So these are the, the clusters I have plotted here in, in color. So the first, one of the clusters is in, in black, so these dots were grouped together, all of these. And then these red dots were. So clearly it drew, drew the line right there, like around 0 0.3. It said, well, there, this is your split line, best split line I can find, two groups. That doesn't seem very smart, does it? That doesn't seem like such a big deal, you know. So I just wanted to demonstrate this is a clustering method. So clustering, you guys are are usually associated with something complicated and advanced. And oh my God, fancy clustering method. No, it doesn't. It could be you could. They can get extremely fancy and complicated mathematically, much more robust than this, and statistically based, and not. They can get really fancy, but the basis of what a clustering method is 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 you just group things. So just because something is called a clustering method does not mean that it's automatically amazing at all, actually. So the, the way that k-means works, like I said, it just kind of finds, it literally looks the, at the difference between this point and this point, and this point and that point, and says, no, no, I'm going to be a part of this cluster. This point is way more similar to me than that point there. It's That's all it's doing. There's much fancier clustering methods which use a statistical distribution to try to estimate, you know, how these points are like diffusing with each other, and much more elegant ways of, you know, am I closer to you or, you know, these points are actually way more spread out than these points and you're here. So imagine you have a clump of points really close to each other and then you have all these points that are right here. Then you have this one point that's here it might actually be more likely that it's part of this like really spread out population, right? Not this like really clumped one. Maybe K-means is going to put it here because like literally the distance from here to here is shorter than the distance from here to these other spread out points. But because these are really spread out, actually, you know, it's not that far, you know, not that far off than C was. That's one way that they can get really fancy and actually more intelligent and more robust and more reliable and would be much more sensible to real life. But in its basis, clustering is really not a big big deal. But it is one one like K means is, is a fair fair game to try, to give give it a try. It's um, all you're telling it is how many clusters you want. You know you have two groups of patients, you're giving it the number of clusters you want. And if we happen to not have these three dots and these three dots, wouldn't it be nice like we would have gotten a really good separation? That's why I circled in blue the ones that, man, I wish these other three patients weren't there. <laughs> you know, because then it would have been really great. We would have said, oh, wow, look at that. You know, it seems like a lot of the k-means agrees with us that the low life cell counts really correlates very well with survival time, for example. It would have really supported sort of our visual intuition about what's going on. Cluster, uh, survival at the same 
if you survival, uh, if you sorry, if you cluster survival, it will find a perfect separation because I have actually happened to purposefully pick patients with really low survival and patients with really high. I actually did that first when I was preparing this workshop. Like, oh sweet, these people are gonna be like so amazing. I'm like, wait, I can't cluster both because that's by definition doing what I. I'm hoping it would do on its own without me telling it. So uh, you can't include your predict the variable that you're trying to predict, which is survival time. You shouldn't include that in your analysis, right? So how, how would you do it? Um, do question mark k means, and it will have an example. So life counts right now is a vector, but you can actually make it a matrix. You can actually use the function C bind or R bind, I think C bind would be the one, to uh, create a matrix where one of the columns is live counts, the other column is survival. And you give that to K means. You can give it as many dimensions as you want. Yeah, if you do question mark, K means will have some examples at the bottom, and they're not just with a vector, they're with a matrix. And uh, it will look much better <laughs> if you do that. Um, when you do K, K, uh, this, this line and then you print out KM, you can see what it looks like on the screen and try to understand, you know, what, what are these things, you know, it has this like one, 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 two, one, two, two, whatever. You know, that's just the 20 patients that you have, it's assigning a label to them. You belong to cluster one, you belong to cluster one, you belong to cluster two, you belong to cluster one, you belong to two, two, and so on. And so that's why when I do call the color equals km, this value of cluster, that's why, that's how it gets colored. It's because the color is now a vector of length 20, and for each point that I'm plotting, it's using the first color. Oh, sorry, for the first point I plot, it uses the first color that I passed it. For the second point that I plot, it uses the second color that I passed it. And because I'm using the cluster numbers, some of the points get color one, which is black, some of the points get color two, which is red. You can define a variable just before your plotting function. Everywhere you say one, you can say color equals black. Everywhere it's, it's uh, two, you can say color equals blue. C-bind? Okay. Yeah. There you go. So is everyone okay with this? Uh, this is, I'm not teaching you K-means. I'm just giving you sort of, this is what it looks like. If you're interested, go and read about it on your own time. Um, there's actually, I, I included this link here, a really nice, very simple to follow tutorial that explains exactly how K-means goes about separating your points into these two clusters. And it's a really nice sort of illustration of computer logic, how the computer would... When you look at some points yourself with your eyes, your eyes actually are really fancy in the way that they work with your brain. They, you know, you immediately see the pattern. Humans have a really good aptitude for seeing patterns, just like looking too, at it. Computer is not very good. Humans are too good. Too good? There you go. A computer is, is not biased like that. It, it will not just it's assume biased, it has it's to biased be. in different ways. <laughs> but it's an equal opportunity, right? It's, it's, a, different, it's a different opportunity. Okay, different, different opportunity. <laughs> That's one of the things I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my sort of color thing that I keep doing over and over and over again with information samples. All I can see now is the populations that I first defined. Yep. And, I, and that, uh, no matter how hard I try, I can't. You know, I find myself going, but I want to look at the populations I've always looked at before, rather yeah. than rather than just looking at some new ones. So, which is you need fun. to remove all variables, clear your workspace of your brain. Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> um, but that's why uh, hopefully, hopefully, that's a segue to your next, uh, your next topic. Oh, what is that? Yeah, oh, no, I don't know. I don't remember. A couple, what it was. A couple more topics. <laughs> okay. Um. How, what time is it? So 10 more minutes then? Or what is 12.30 was the lunch yes. time? I, I forget. Um, okay. Okay, so what, so far we um, 
extracted the viable CD3 positive cells. Those are the ones that are biologically relevant for us. And now we have a few more colors that we can work with and play around with the phenotypes and see what phenotypes are actually responsible for the survival time difference. So now we have to gate basically define the in order remember in order for us to check all these phenotypes we have to first define the gates for each marker individually right because otherwise how am i gonna be able to define the phenotype cd8 positive cd4 negative cd127 positive i have to tell archaeoptimics what do i mean by positive and negative what is the cutoff value that i'm using to call anything about that positive anything about that negative so as a first step, we're going to, let's consider CD4 first, and we want to define a gate, and let's, uh, let's do it like we did it before. We create, so first of all, I'm going to name CD4 to be um, this, this V655-A. I'm going to just put that as a variable CD4 so I don't have to type this long thing ever again. Step one, like we did before, we did a pooled frame, get global frame, out of this viable flow set, the one with the CD3 positive black cells. And let's plot it. There it is. It's plotted. Is everyone happy with the plotting and the getting global frame thing? We just did that. There it is. It, I, I can see the gate looks like it should be 1.5 or something like that in the middle. But I don't, obviously, like you guys have been asking all along, you know, you don't, we don't want to be just looking at it and trying to see is it 1.5, 1.4, 1.42. So we want to do this in an automated fashion. And DE gate is a function of flow density. And it's, in fact, the function of flow density that does the gate, the, the density gating. Sorry. It's density gates. That's what, it stands, what the DE stands for. But you don't want to type in density gate, so it's D gate. I thought you were just channeling, channeling gate. No. <laughs> uh, so. So what? Um, I'm getting a warning message. Um, max, absolute. Of the iteration I, no missing, no non mixing, no limits to max returning dash inf negative infinity. <laughs> so there's one, there's, there was one event when we looked at it where the patients see three count, the box in the three count was minus one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, it's worked, it's just warm. Uh, where is it? Oh, the other one, I see. Oh, is this, this, this one? Okay. No. Yeah, it probably is. So, um, when you run DE gate, what it, what it, it, it gives you the, if you print out CD4.gate, what value does it print for you guys? 1.5, something like that. There you go. I wouldn't have guessed that by eyeballing it, but, you know, close enough. Um, so it's very close to your own, like, what you're seeing, right? And and you can, um, if you say graphs equal, true, equal to true and DE gate, it will actually generate this plot for you, the density plot. And this is how it does it, okay? So this is CD, CD4 over here on the y-axis of the, the nice-looking plot. And you see there's a bunch of cells here, a bunch of cells here, and sort of like very few cells in between them. So the density looks exactly like this. There's a big peak where the negatives are, a slightly smaller peak where the positives are. What dense, dense, flow density does is it identifies all the peaks in your density data, so all the peaks. So it will find this peak, it's at 1, right? The value 1. It will find this peak, which is approximately at the value 2. And then it will actually find the minimum point in between those two values, between the two peaks. 
So it literally tries to find the exactly best position to place this gate that you would otherwise be eyeballing, like where should I place it a little bit tighter towards the upper population or the lower or what. So it actually places it exactly where it's optimal density wise. So um, if there were three peaks that has some very detailed uh, reasoning, logical reasoning, first of all, if there's a very, very tiny little peak, there actually is one. You can hardly see it. If that peak is <coughs> 20 times smaller than the highest peak in the population, it's going to ignore it as a like kink of the data, like you need one cell there, two cells there. It's just a little noise, basically. So it's going to ignore the extremely small peaks that are clearly just noise in the data. Um, if there's three peaks, that are, then I'm not actually sure what it does right now because I didn't write the final code. But uh, it has some kind of reasoning as to which one to return. Like if, if it only spins in two. Yes. Yeah, it only, it only one returns one, one yeah, unless, yeah, one unless yeah. you, uh, if you read the help on the uh, flow density package, especially if you do question mark DE gate, there's actually a bunch of other parameters you can add. Here, if you add graphs equals true, it will all give you the gate, but also print this plot for you. Um, if you do comma all dot cut equals true, this here we call it a cut point. It's a point at which we decided to cut the data into two. If you do all dot cut equals true, it will actually, if there was a third peak here, it will also give you the, the second cut point. So it will give you all the cut points that it found. So if it found four peaks, it will give you three of the cut points. And then if you know what your data is and you know that you expect to see, you know, sort of two negative populations and one positive, whatever it is biologically that's meaningful, then you could totally make the choice for do you want to take the, the first cut point or the second cut point? Or do you want to do some kind of test using those cut points and then decide which one is the one that makes sense for you? So it's actually very versatile and it's not a uh, as black of a box as you may wish that it were. Like it's not like it will tell you by definition this is the where you should draw your gate. That's kind of up to you a little bit. It, it helps you out with using a density and trying to give you a logical place to draw the gate. But in the end, is there a threshold for when it won't draw a line? Is that trough what gets higher up? No, it, uh, so as long as it's a peak, it, it will find it. Um, is there a way to adjust the threat? So what if, what if, it's a what if you run a unimodal population? So there? that's where Ryan was talking about the five ways that it will set a gate. So if let, let's, let's ignore this first one. So if there's only one peak, what it will do is, um, I'm not sure what the default method is, but what it can do is you can either use a standard deviation method where first it's going to locate your peak your mode and then it's going to estimate what is the standard deviation of this distribution if it's kind of like a normal distribution you know yeah 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 it's gonna it's gonna take your peak and it's going to say okay i'm gonna estimate the uh, standard deviation i'm gonna put the gate two standard deviations away from the peak that's going to be my, my gate. Okay. Um, um, first, it's going to try to estimate, is this population all positive or all negative? And it's going to do that based on, is it like higher than the middle, sort of, or is it lower than the middle of, of the range of values for that channel? Not quite, but something along those lines. You can read the details. Um, and then based on, is if let's say that it decides this is mostly a positive population, then it's going to do two standard deviations below the mode. You can also specifically tell it, is it positive or negative. You can also, instead of the standard deviation, you can tell it three standard deviations or one standard deviation. If you want your gate to be tighter, you can decrease the number of standard deviations away from the mode you want to go. If if you want your gate to be kind of like fairly loose, you know, the, I really want to be as far away from that population as I can with my gate. I don't want like any other cell that's right here to be positive. I want it to be further from the population, you can say four standard deviations. Instead of that, you can also use a percentile method, which is for if you have, uh, like I used Armstrong's data, when I was analyzing your data, you had negative controls, 
if you have a negative control and you want to define a gate based on a negative control, then you could use a percentile method and say the 99th percentile of my negative. I know all these are negative for sure. Just give me the 99th percentile. That's going to be, I'm going to take that value, let's say it's 1.47, and then on my actual, not the negative control data, but my actual data, I'm just going to use 1.47. So it, it's very versatile. It can either, if it has two peaks, it will try to find the minimum cut point. If it uh, only has one peak, it can do things like standard deviation, percentile. It can try to detect an inflection point. OK, so that transition from finding the trough to um, switching to standard deviation, can you adjust when that occurs, like that, the, the value of that? Uh, no, it will. Uh, if it finds two peaks, it will give you the cut point. If it if it if there's only one peak, then it will do something by default. I think the the ninety fifth percentile by default, unless you also specify use the standard deviation method. You can say. Uh, Gate this and use the standard deviation method. If it happens to be a case like this where there's two peaks, it's going to ignore the fact you said use standard deviation because, hey, there's no need for that. You have the two peaks right there. But if it finds only one peak in one of your samples, then it's going to revert to fall back on the standard deviation method that you specify. You, once this package comes out and by conductor, I guess we'll send you an email and there will be a much more detailed step-by-step -step example of if your function looks like, or if your density looks like this, this is what it's going to do, and, and so is, on. Is that currently, like, in our DM environment right now? Can you have that? Sort of. If you do question mark gate, it will have a so lot of... Just, just sure. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, but Sorry. Yes. But there's also something that I will need you to do while... Everything's fine. Everything's working now. Let's pretend that never happened. <laughs> to move on. So we talked about what did we do so far? We just looked up CD4 and we plotted it. We saw that there's a nice separation in the CD4 positive and negative population. And we decided that using flow density's DE gate function is reasonable. Instead of us trying to eyeball everything every time. As long as you've got positive and negative gates. Yeah, exactly. So now, why don't we try to gate the other uh, channels that we have? We have KI67, CD8, and CD127. We already did CD4. Right? We already defined that. So here I just I'm just defining it again. I don't want to type out all of these B five one five blah blah. I'm just gonna rename them. So then also when I'm reading my code later, it's gonna make more sense to me. It's, it's not gonna be saying plot whatever all these things. It's gonna say plot C three or C four for example. More, more sensible. So we're good on this. And now I'm going to be looping through all of the channels, CD4, CD8, CD127, KI67, all the channels of interest. And I'm going to be using uh, DE gate to define the channels, but I want to store them in, in a vector, right? I don't want to just loop them, calculate them, then replace the value and just plot it. I, I want to actually store these values. So. For the purposes of storing these values, I'm going to define an empty, uh, basically a vector with the values negative infinity. In the end, I want that the vector store dot gates. I want it to look like this. I want it to be 1.47 comma 2.1 comma 1.3 comma 1.6. Those are going to be the gates for CD4, CD8, CD127, K67. That's what I want. Does that make sense? I want to have a variable which stores my gates. And it's called so store gates. So, so one minus infinity. Minus oh. infinity because uh, it's just it, you can pick any value because it's going to be replaced when I'm looping through. 
but the starting value I set personally to minus infinity because to me, by default, I don't want the gates to to make any sense, right? I don't if I if I initialize all of the gates to be one, the value one, then if something went wrong, I did miss the line or didn't loop through all of them by accident, then I get my final gates and they're like 1.2, 1.31, 1.1. The one might kind of I might miss it. It might actually be a bug. So if one, in one of zero, you can do zero, but zero is still a legit value. Sure. Right? Yeah. You could like zero is kind of still within the bounds of reasonable. It's so a it's, personal choice. So it's it, but it's, yeah, it's an imaginary number. So exact. Well, is, yeah, is it, is it's it, not imaginary. It, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a number either, but. <laughs> That is a different a workshop <laughs> altogether. <laughs> yeah, it's a concept, exactly. Okay. So um, this is my own personal programmer's choice of default value for a gate. You can choose your own. And it will be replaced. So I'm also, just for good programming practice, going to give names to the uh, elements of the vector. Because I want to make sure I don't accidentally mess up. Was it the, was the first number the C4 one or the C8 one? I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to have to keep it straight in my mind always that I decided to to, to do it C4 first and then C8 and then C127 and then K67. I don't want to have to remember that. And also just for debugging purposes. So. If you print out store gates, you should see just a bunch of negative infinity values and with names. So now, while I'm assigning values to this vector, I'm also going to be plotting them and visualizing them just to make sure that DE gate is doing what I expect it to do. So I'm going to go through all the channels in this order, CD4, CD8, CD127, KI67. What I'm going to do in this loop is plot the, um, using flow density's plotting function, the pooled frame, and on the x-axis I'm going to plot CD3, and on the y-axis I'm going to plot Chan. That's the thing I'm looping over. So I expect to see four plots. CD3 versus CD4, CD3 versus CD8, CD3 versus 127, CD3 versus KI67. Because I'm looping through this, one of my channels is going to be changing, right? The other one, I chose CD3. You can choose side scatter. You can choose forward scatter. Something that doesn't change with the loop for the x-axis. It's up to you. I chose CD3 just for the purposes of visualizing. On this line, now remember how you can uh, get the first entry of a vector by saying, you know, your vector name and then square brackets one, right? That will just give you the first. Or if the entries have names, instead of one, you can just say the CD4 channel name. You can index by name instead of by, by number. Because I gave my vector names to begin with, now I can just, that entry, instead of negative infinity, I want to replace it with the actual gate value. Okay, D gate of the pulled frame, comma, the channel that you want the gate for, is going to return a value. Like before, for the CD4 one, it returned 1.47 or something like that. So this part here is going to return something such as 1.47. I'm going to put it in place of the negative infinity of the store gates in the spot for the channel that I'm at in, in my loop. If you want, you can add just, be, just before this line, you can add a print statement. You can say print D gate pulled frame channel. Then I'm also going to, because this plot is going to be active, I'm going to add a line to visualize the place of this gate. But 
questions? So the variables, the names of the variables are still See the names exactly. The names are like one of the fourth name is Ki67, but Ki67 is actually B515, right? I'm keeping them like this because they're still like this in the flow frame. So if you if you gave um, if you tried to plot the frame and you said CD3, it would be like there's no CD3. There's only R780-A in the flow frame. So. CD3 is actually a variable, it's not a string, uh, and it's a variable that just helps me avoid having to type the string, but really the, it's the string that's there. Does it make sense, sort of? So you can see here I printed out, this is what the what it ends up being, right? So the gate for the first thing, so CD4, is 1.498, whatever. The gate for V800 is this. Your numbers, are they slightly different than mine? Yeah. Yours. Yeah. Yes. Why? Because we have to find the gate. But in this case, the so, gate for cash is not really Yeah. What so is it? One. So basically, we have gated, gated. Yeah, yours, yours looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few cells that are yeah. running yes. most of the yeah. Whereas I ended up getting almost uh, all of them. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, so everything else comes. That's a, uh, an issue with DE gate. Uh, remember how I said it's not an issue, like a, uh, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's um, you have to help it out, basically. Um, if you do question mark DE gate, you can say yeah, actually it's wrong. Look at the upper. Actually, this is one of the most amazing explanation. So, if you do upper equals true in uh, your DE gate uh, call, yeah, here where you call DE gate, if you put a comma after chan and say upper equals true. It may, I'm not sure, but it may help it, uh, oh, but then, look what's happening Oh, right, okay, so see, you will only, you will have to either add an if statement, uh, to only do a break was true for this channel, Okay. Or you can just remove that and then replace just the KI67 entry with Yeah, outside of I will show you. Wasn't it supposed to be automated? Sorry? So this is probably trying to get things to work when things change. You're trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're trying to do supervised automated or getting in a supervised fashion. Yeah. So we end up having to do these tweaks yeah. the first time. But then okay. it's going to take you some time. Yeah. And then it is, then you never have to do that tweaking again. So just let me just see point where point. we are. Shoot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um sometimes what happens is you only have a single cell population. And you know that this should all be negative, but DE gate by default yeah. is thinking that it might yeah. actually be positive. The reason is because the density, uh, you know, the density looks like this, right? But sometimes the density looks a little more like that. Sometimes it looks a little more like this. Yeah. It tries to estimate which one of these does it look more like, and then I think based on that it decides if it's all negative or positive. So yours just looks a little backwards according to flow density. Um, so you can help it along by adding a parameter which is upper equals true, which tells it put it in the upper put the gate on the upper side of the the peak that you find. Yeah. 
right? It kind of forces it to go that way. Should say operating is true if. So this is how you can do that. If Chan equals Ki sixty seven. This is for people that decided to do a tighter gate for the C three smart asses, <laughs> <laughs> and then now they're a little bit they're getting slightly different results. But this is how you would this is also useful for you to know if you wanted to add an if statement. Let's say you're cycling through many many channels, not just these four like thirteen or something. And you know that for for one of for most of them, this will do the right thing. For some of them, maybe let me, let me just type it out and I'll tell you. Let's say that for some of them, you you want to use what make use of one of the extra parameters that DE gate has. For example, if the channel name is KI67, then maybe you want to add something extra to DE gate, such as use SD, use the standard deviation method, and the number of standard deviations is three. Otherwise, just do the normal thing you normally do, because that seems to be the, the right thing for the other channels. In fact, if your um, gate is so bizarre that there's really no logic to it, but you know you have decided it's going to be like this, you could even do something like this instead. This is one option. You can just give it the value instead of just battling with trying to find something that will automa automatically make it the thing exactly that you know you want, why don't you just tell it what you want? Manual <laughs> getting at its best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I have had to do this when I get data sets that have not really good compensation and really there is no way of automating the manual analysis. And I have made the biologist aware of the fact that perhaps their data quality is not sufficient for any analysis, but they insist on me trying to do something anyways. And I say, fine, let me do it for you anyways. You tell me the number where and where the gate should be. And I send them a plot of, this is what I'm looking at. You draw the line where you think it should go. I can't tell. And they just draw the line somewhere. You know? And then I just put that value in. And give them the results and and look, the results are terrible, there's nothing. It's all random because it was all not very good. But you can give it a try still. Or, or maybe it is one of those weird looking stains that it just always looks really weird and you trust that your expertise is sufficient that you can manually set the, that one gate. So there, now you have an if statement if you ever needed to um, use that. And so uh, this is what mine looked like, yeah. right? So, so tell me about the, the CD2. One twenty star. Yeah. You tell me. Does it look any good, or does it look wrong to you? It looks wrong to me. Yeah, I, I, I agree know, with you. I don't even know what CD127. Is. I also don't know. What I would do is, you know, at this point, just make the decision to discard this. I would I obviously talk to the biologist first, but then I discovered you don't know how much how much effort I put into it. For the purposes of this workshop, I will discard it actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, does anybody know anything about CD one twenty seven that they could tell me that could tell um, me how to gate no. this better? Actually, no. It looks pretty. Um, actually, no. It looks like it could be okay. I don't know if you've seen it before. What I would prefer is to have a control. Yeah, sure. That would be nice. <laughs> like an FMO or any. 
to as a, at least sort of and give me an idea of where the gate may fly. What flow density is seeing is sort of it's actually here using the track slope where it's kind of seeing a little kink in the density around there and that's it's thinking maybe that's what you're looking for. <laughs> it's trying to please us but uh, um, uh, when I'm when I look at this I would have to have a very long and deep discussion with the biologist about please explain to me how this makes sense and why there is no control for this kind of stain that looks like this right and uh, if they if they can you know convince me that there is some kind of logic to it or if they tell me you know what just this one time let's let's run it then I will just use their manual value for, like I would add another if statement But the others look okay, right? Are we okay with the others? So I just want, because remember this is the uh, pooled frame. I'm plotting the pooled frame. So what if the, the problem is not necessarily with 3127, but the problem is with my pooled flow frame? Maybe maybe for this particular channel, there is a quite a bit of variation to the point where if I were to just plot one sample, maybe there will be obviously obvious where the gate is but because I'm combining all of them maybe I'm superimposing them to the point where I'm uh, hiding the split point so what I have done is I have plotted uh, side scatter versus CD127 for every single sample and just trying to look at that and see is it still not obvious where the gate should go and to me it still is not obvious where the gate should go so I would also present this to uh, to the biologists and ask them, you know, uh, is this what's going on? Does this make sense so far? You're trying to plot it against other things, or yeah, yeah. So, so that's a good point, actually. Um, yeah, it didn't help. Huh? It didn't help. I still don't think. I think it looks like it's a compensation thing, or like autofluorescence. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shape, but it's just shifted along yeah, yeah, so exactly. Yeah, I tried it. I tried plotting it against other parameters as well. It didn't. It didn't make it any more obvious. Okay, uh, I've actually yeah. So plotting it against Ki67 gives you something because Ki67 is a proliferation marker and 127 is a memory marker. So you actually start to see some. Of, yeah. So you actually start to see some of the gates probably about. The gate shifts in each one's memory because, because each patient has a different proportion of proliferating memory cells. That is really, really tough. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to ignore this worker. We can't because we've got all these patients still in. No, for the purposes of this workshop, for, for, uh, there is there is a way that you can handle. <laughs> talking like true mathematicians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I need that result. Yeah, I need it now. Seeing the patient in the clinic as we speak. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to walk in to see the patient right now. Come on. Uh, <laughs> try a different transformation. Very good point as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, just on this one. Absolutely. Yeah. So things to try when you see something doesn't look like it's nice at all. Try a different transformation. What about the uh, 
gauge lines? Would it, or, yeah, the D gauge, would it, uh, depends on the original values or the transformed values? The transformed. Yeah. It, it, that's why you need a good transformation. It's not just so we look at it and it looks good, but the method looks at it and is able to distinct. You know, when you have two yeah. peaks that are extremely close together, uh, sometimes it's the method won't be able to um, believe that these two peaks are actually meant to be two separate populations because they're so close together. It could be an artificially created double peak. Because uh, what D gate actually does is uh, the way that it estimates the density of your points that you have is it kind of smooths it out uh, a little bit. Because if you do it exactly based on all the points that you have, you will have little kinks, right? Like the actual density is little kinks of dots, individual dots. Every little dot that you have is going to be a little peak on its own, right? Um, so there's a little bit of a smoothing procedure that goes on. And it would just smooth right over if you do the if you don't transform it. So things to consider is possibly going back uh, before you transformed your data and transforming just this one channel using a different transformation, maybe using different logical transform parameters. Um, other things plot against other variables, like other other parameters. This is the thing about the biologists should be able to, to tell you, right? They're the ones that designed this panel in such a way. They must know, uh, hopefully may have known how they were going to gate it before they made the panel, maybe not. Uh, another thing to consider in this for this purposes of this workshop, I did truncate the data. They were actually 13 colors. So maybe one of the ones I removed would have helped us here. Right? There we just unfortunately to analyze this will take months, right? So So anyways, for for the, these are just things to keep in mind that you can go back and try to do a different transformation, like you said, plot against different something different. And if ideally have if it is possible to have some kind of uh, control, um, the way you would incorporate the control would be in this if statement. If the channel is CD127, define the gate to be the one based on my control. Right? So you, you would first calculate previously something, calculate um, gate for CD127 based on control using DE gate and the quantile or percentile so you could have you know read in your control file FCS file a transform that in the same way you did this one and uh, use DE gate and a percentile to calculate where the gate like maybe the 99th percentile or 99.5th percentile whatever you you feel comfortable with to calculate for the CD127 channel, and then maybe that value would have been 1.67, and then here you would have put 1.67. That's just one thing you may encounter as something useful to do. So for now, let's uh, just ignore CD127. So at this point, we only have CD4, CD8, and KI67 to work with. And we can at least try to plot the gates for, for that, and at least make sure that those gates we are happy with for all of our samples. I only, uh, I'm only showing the CD4 one. Does this plotting thing make sense? It's the same, plotting the same, like we're just looping through. Uh, first of all, I define my plotting region to be 5 by 4 with my margins a little bit smaller than the default one so we can actually see it on the, in our studio. Then I'm going for I from 1 to 20 and plot dense, the flow density plotting function. Here's my flow frame. My two channels I want to plot. So I'm plotting CD8, uh, CD4 and CD8, and then I'm doing a CD8 versus KI67. You can do whatever 
other one. I just want Ki67 to be also plotted. Um, then I'm drawing some straight lines where the gate, my gates were. So AB line is the straight line, V is vertical. And what value do I want for the vertical? I want the store.gates CD4. I want the whatever value it was, like 1.67, whatever, 5, I don't know. I want that, that value to be plotted. Twice the line width of normal line, blue. Any questions about this? This plotting thing? No? Everyone's totally cool with that because we did it so many times. And you can do it now too from scratch. I saw this. Though. Where we the find yeah. So how did we how did we get how did we get So here this line okay, so start all gates rep means repeat okay. negative infinity four times. Okay. It's gonna give you a vector that has the values negative infinity, negative infinity, negative infinity, negative infinity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Hmm? A quick way of doing a for loop? What do you mean? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so there, the way you define a vector is, uh, so there's one way, yeah, exactly, you're right, yeah. It's uh, just a function to, uh, just like you know how we define the vector uh, for the values from 1 to 100. I had 1 colon 100. And that does like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for us. That's a standard thing you normally would be using in programming. We also had the other way of defining a vector, which was SEQ sequence, where you give it a starting value from two and then by. So if I want to go from one to 100, but I want to go every, every third number, by was three, it's going to give me one, four, and so on. Rep is repeat because also. also Oftentimes, you just want actually many times before just initialize initialize things to zero a lot, you know. And if you have a hundred things, yeah, it's just uh, one other way of defining a vector. I have probably defined a vector all of those ways, right? Just to try to define it a different way every time so that you see it in a different way, because you will see it, people using all the different ways. Suzanne, does that make sense? Yeah. And so the plotting thing, we all know how to plot this stuff. Good. It all looks fairly all right, right? OK, so before I go into the flow type, um, I didn't want to do too much and, and leave you guys completely confused, so I'm going to just say this. We used DE gate to define the gates, right? Using the density, it was very nice, very automated, and blah. But we really used the pooled frame to do that, right? We took one pulled sample from all, all of our data and use DE gate to help us find the gates, but we're applying that exact same value to every single flow frame. But like you guys know, typically the gate varies just ever so slightly between samples. So it would be really cool if we could just you know automatically move it for every flow frame individually. And you you technically have the tools to do that should be able to do that on your own. You, you would have probably for loops and things like this or how would we be able to do that? Where do I get the gates here?
So instead of having, a, for example, instead of having a vector uh, for, for, for the gates, so my vector here, it has one gate for CD4, one gate for CD8, one gate for this, one gate for that. Instead, I could have a matrix where each row is for the sample, each sample, each flow frame has its own row. And so I could create this using another for loop where for each flow frame, so I'm going to go for the first flow frame, then for the second, for the third. For each channel, it's inception. It's a for loop within a for loop. Calculate the gate, not for the pulled frame, but for viable.fsi. For the ith frame, calculate for this channel the gate. So don't, don't overthink it, just the gist of what no, I'm no, saying, no, no, that, that does makes, it make sense? That makes perfect sense. Okay. <laughs> because it does. Sometimes when I hear myself, it sounds well, because, like because because you look at this and you you can see that the gates on many of these are wrong. Yeah, you know, and that makes you very upset. I can see. It's good. It should make you very upset. For the purposes of this workshop, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm upset. New favorite phrase. I'm, 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 I'm upset for the purposes. Of this. <laughs> good. Good. I'm writing that down. That was <laughs> Uh, so it's because honestly, the, the, this analysis, it's, uh, this is really the steps that I go through every time I analyze a data set. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not doing anything fancier than this, really, honest. It's just um, for every different data set, there's slightly different things I have to handle. Maybe the transformation will take me a bit longer to get the right one. Maybe the move, removing the debris won't be so easy and I'll have to fudge with it a little. Um, all these little things, I it, it will take me a month to analyze a data set like this. Anywhere from 18 to, to, to I don't know, how what's the biggest? 500. Yeah. 500. Yeah. Oh, 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 10,000. Yeah. Published studies. Yeah. And if you're doing, yeah, if you're doing that, then you want to probably not run any Mac and talk to your. So all, all your stuff you're doing here can run a more powerful computer to really do. And so we haven't covered this here, but high performance computing can really easily do run full data, getting stuff on servers. Everything works in a chart. But don't try and do that locally. And don't try and read large file, large files in. Small machines, unless you use like NetCDF load. Or just bog down and just load. So no, don't. You have a good, you know, fast computer though. Mm -hmm. So, let's see if we can break it. So, uh, store, store based is channel viable.fs. I think that's an I. And then the same. Then first you will have to initialize exactly. Remember how we initialized the store gates to be a vector of four with the negative infinities? Now you have to initialize it to be a matrix. You couldn't do question mark matrix and C. No, she told me that. Before. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Is it a matrix? Matrix. Yeah, just matrix. Can everyone type in library flow type in library archaeoptimix just to make sure? Good. Yeah. 
between I'm sure it will work from the first try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will work. <laughs> Did everyone's uh, gates kind of look like this at some point? Yeah? Okay. Good. Did it work for you? Or? Sometimes if it's, uh, no matter what you're trying, if you're trying to use a different method, you put all of it, detect the gate, and it just won't do it, and you don't want to waste your time because you can see what the gate will be. Just type in, no, just, no, just put the box, just the box. Can we move to float type? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You can do it, we have a coffee break coming up soon, so you can. Okay, so. Float type. It didn't? Work. It didn't? No. Okay, something. Because you also have this line, so no matter what, you're also replacing it by this. So if the channel is this, you do that. Else, you do that, but then you also do that again. 
that's what the problem was. You were replacing whatever value was centering. The problem was that just another example. Oh, I should have. No, was there originally. I just added uh, that else and found that. Okay. So I. <laughs> so uh, remember Archeoptimix.plot with the red and yellow and blue and green with the phenotypes in it? That's the one that we want. Um, in order to create that plot, we, um, we first have to find all of our proportions of all of those phenotypes. So let all of our phenotypes, for example, one of the phenotypes would be CD4 positive. We have to calculate what is our proportion of CD4 positive in each of the samples, right? That's what flow type does. So flow type is a package which calculates the proportions in all phenotypes possible in your data. So you give it your flow set, rather your flow frame actually. <laughs> You give it your uh, the markers that you're interested in. So we're not we're not going to be calculating phenotypes based on forward and side scatter, right? So we're not going to give it those. We're going to specify we only care about CD4, CD8, and KS67. <coughs> so when you call flow type, the first thing you do is give it the one flow frame, the prop markers, the the proportion markers, the ones that you care about. Here they are, 7, 6, and 4, because CD4 is the 7th channel, CD8 was the 6th channel, K67 was the 4th channel in our data, in our flow frame. Then you have this method that you have to supply to flow type. And that's the method, how, how do I separate positive versus negative? What method should I use to tell for each of those pr proportion markers you give me? What method should I use to separate the positives versus the negatives? Just the gates, right? It has an, an alternative where instead of uh, the gates, you could specify some automated method of calculating it, like key means or something, but that's not going to work very well. So just we're just going to always work with our own gates. We're going to first calculate our gates and then give them to flow type. So here's our gates, store.gates, and what does this do? Does anyone know? Why do I have this? Let me actually um, do this in the virtual box. <clears throat> so these are our gates. Remember the CD4, CD8, and KI67 of this. To get the CD4 one, I can just go like this, right? If I wanted to rearrange those, I, I, or subset them, just, just taking these three, for example, I could do that, right? So sometimes when you have many, many parameters, many channels, and many gates, you, you may accidentally get the order wrong in one of them. So in order to keep consistent your order, instead of subsetting things with indices like one, two, three, try to use names as much as you can. So the reason why I have this here is because I I I am using uh, actually remember how I had CD127 before and now I don't right so if I hadn't done this part actually I I should be like this right I can't just give it store gates because that has four things, but flow type expects me. I'm only I told it that I'm only interested in the three markers. So 
which gates should I be passing? Instead of saying, I, mean, I know that the CD127 was the third gate, so I could have said store gates, uh, give it the first, the second, and the fourth. That's the same thing, right? But just so that I don't get myself confused with, you know, the seventh channel is CD4, but the first gate corresponds to CD4, I don't want to get myself confused, so I'm just going to call it CD4, CD8, okay, I67. I will always use that order. Because alphabetically. Yeah. Yeah. So this part makes sense that the, the method that flowtype is going to be using to uh, define my phenotypes, you know, which which cells are positive, which are negative, is the gates that I have calculated in my own way. However, you want to calculate them. Flowtype does not care how you calculate your gates. You could have just given them numbers, manual numbers, you know, two, four, six. Or you could have used flow density, or you could have used any other method that you want. And then just for the purposes of flow type, making sure that it's going to uh, give them nice looking labels, so that the, the phenotypes are going to have nice names. Um, I'm using the, um, first I'm redefining the call names of viable.fs. And I'm going to just give it that so that it knows what are the antibodies that I'm working with. This is how you can rename the call names of the, your flow set. Remember how before they were forward scatter, forward scatter, side scatter, V650, whatever stuff. At this point, from now on, I'm going to be looking at phenotypes. I don't want to have a phenotype V650 plus 4780. A R minus. Yes. Yes. Technically speaking, you could have done that as a very first step when you first read in your flow set. You could have, you could have renamed everything. I didn't do that because sometimes when I'm plotting things, flow density also adds the the channel like the channel name and the antibody name. Some people like I know it it has meaning right, which. Yeah detector was was used so that's why I didn't do it earlier but at this point all that I will care be caring about is the phenotypes which are based on the marker names exactly does it does it make sense how I renamed the call names of viable FS does that make sense I just replaced whatever that would typically return to me with the thing that I wanted to return from now on Okay, so this this is what flow type, how, how you call flow type for one flow frame. So now FT1, what it's going to do is it's going to take your, your flow frame, the first one, Viable FS1. It's going to go through all of these, um, it's going to go through CD4, CD8, and KI67. And using your gates, it's going to calculate, okay, how many cells are CD4 positive? Then it's going to go, how many cells are CD4 positive and CD8 positive? How many cells are CD4 positive, CD8 positive, and K67? How does it do that? It just uses the same things we did before, which uh, you know, express F uh, CD3 is, or CD4 is greater than 1.67. Intersect with, which are K67 greater than the K67 gate. So it just uses a combination of which and intersect statements that we have been using so far. But it's going to do that for all the possible combination of these three markers with pluses and minuses. So it's just for, for your convenience. It's not doing anything super crazy. It's just saving you some time. So on that line right there, um, this is flow type. It's a two flow type pass the frame called viable.fs and the viable one. Mm -hmm. Viable.fs and the viable one. What is that? It's the first flow frame okay. of Why the. It's like a list, right? Um, you know how a vector you have single brackets. Uh, a list you have double brackets because a list is more of a deeper structure than just a simple vector. A vector just has one, like a number, like one, two, three, four. A list can have like much more complicated things in it. So for that reason, we're like 
<laughs> if, if an actual programmer heard me explaining this stuff. So, yeah. the, 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 you know, the, you're talking about stuff that's just it's intrinsic knowledge. That's just the way it is. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's yeah. just learning the language. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We only have so many characters in the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So what does FT1 contain? Uh, did you guys take a look at it after you calculated it? Like when you print it to the screen, it has a lot of things. How would we like, instead of like scrolling up all this way, how could we explore it a little more efficiently? FT1 at tab. Did everyone get to that? Yeah? I typed FT1. And then at, and then I press tab to see what are the possible things. So let's look at the first one. What is that? So let's see the first entry of that. CD4 minus C8 minus 700. There's 700 cells, which are CD4 negative, CD8 negative. And it, 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 see, see what I mean? Like if you had to, if I asked you to, on your own, can you calculate how many cells, can you count how many cells are in the phenotype CD4 negative, CD8 negative? What would you have done? You would have had uh, one line of code saying, the CD4 negative indices are, which express my frame, CD4 is less than the CD4 gate, and then intersect dot with which express F CD8 is less than blah blah blah. That's what flow type does for you. It kind of just takes care of that. Will it work if you use the sort of decking? Yeah. If it splits it into three, is it going to say C4 minus C4? Damn. Yeah, so not this one, but the new version will will have three levels instead of just always having to call it negative or, or positive. You will be able to have a medium population. Just one medium? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I actually I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to ask. It should be coming out. Or Ryan should be making them make it come out very soon. Karen and Nima? Yeah, they're waiting on Holger to finish the paper. Okay. Holger's PI. Okay. You can't make them do anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's coming out soon. <laughs> um, so, does this make sense? What flow type has done here? Does it make sense? Yeah. It just, okay. What else how does it have? For those of you who are interested in MFIs, um, it has also done that. If you have such a data set that you feel is um, going to benefit from using MFIs instead, this, this, you know, this, these are transformed. Yeah, right. this is the, and this is where it's, this is, yeah, this is where it's starting to get exciting. This is where it's, yeah. Yeah actually automating all the shit. Because otherwise, yeah. otherwise... You would not want to be doing this from scratch, be, huh? Otherwise, you'd be kinging me in, in Excel. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, 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 that's the other place we play with this. So that's where you would do the reverse of the swamp, right? You'd take this out? You just got to do so much time. I haven't. Um, so there's two options. One is you can... Um, can we compare... Let's see. So we we did the, we did the logical transform, right? Um, inverse logical. Hmm. How does it work? So this is like coming up one and one inception. Exactly. <laughs> wake up. <laughs> <laughs> wake up. Where's Whoever. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, you can probably do that. I have never actually done that. So, 
You know how we define the logical transform? Yeah. And then we applied that to our data to actually yeah, transform yeah. it? So now you can yeah, define. Can you these, right? Yeah, why don't we try it? Is it it depends you on what you're doing with it. It doesn't matter, but if you really want to make like a full change. That's an, a, yeah, see that's, first of all, I, I don't like using RFIs because there's variability that I really don't believe when they tell me, oh no, no, trust me, the, here there's no instrument or day-to-day -day variability, right? I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't use it, but uh, some people insist on comparing it for maybe for standardization purposes. Actually, one of the projects that Ryan is involved in right now is trying to get different centers to standardize their panels for certain things. And part of the procedure and how do we make sure that all these centers are doing what we are telling them to do is we actually try to get them to get their MFIs to match. That was, that's would be nice. So um, in that case, they you, you would probably want. To. There's no need for a package. I mean, you would have to give it. Uh, what do you mean by package? I mean, all you have to do is just. I see what you mean. I can't remember if uh, does the uh, Ryan, did you hear her question? Does the Flow QB package have a converter between MFI and MESF? No, like that would require a lot of inf information you'd have to give us about like what voltage you're using and things like that, right? In order to be able to convert between the your MFI that you're if I just tell you, hey, my MFI over here is 700. What's the MESF? I need to have some things to transform. Yeah, exactly. The way MESF is calculated right now, we're pushing three standards at three known, supposedly three known equivalents of molecules that are equivalent for us. Okay, so you push that into the system, you see what your MFI values are for those known standards. Yeah. Then you get out the information on the curve that you can apply your unknown MFIs to. Yeah. It says that 1.59 is actually 20 fluorescent molecules, or your yeah. a real MESF of 20. Is there, how, so how would you transform this here. number back to the original one? Is that yeah, the question? Back to the, to yeah. The MESF, right, the value, to, to the legitimate yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so remember how what we did was we defined our logical transform. Mm -hmm. So here is what we did. Then I did, my value was 220 or whatever you said, for example. And it's 0 0.6 actually. So now I want to go back though, from 0 0.6 I want to go back to 20, right? Um, so here I, I did, I wasn't sure if that was possible, so I did question mark, logical transform. there 
something 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 and typically <laughs> see also is what I go to when I know logical transform is not what I'm looking for but something related to it I go to the see also and there was something called inverse logical transform which I thought well, maybe that's what it is and then I scroll down to the example section so that I could quickly test out my theory so here's what I'm looking for right in logical I misspelled it. I see. Nineteen point nine. It's not I mean I didn't give it the exact value, but there's always a little bit of an error when you transform then reverse the transform because the logical there's no exact closed form solution to it, so it's always slightly estimated. But so let's do uh, you wanted to get the this one, right? Sure. Let's just Three hundred and ninety. So, um, yeah, that's one way. So I'm going to do that. Uh, just in English again. We uh, first defined a logical transform as being something. Like first, I defined the transformation function I will use. I didn't actually transform anything. Uh, notice that here, when I say logical transform, and I open and close the bracket without putting anything in it, that means that I am accepting the default values. Okay. Uh, in this example, if you notice, someone defined a logical transform, they did not accept the default values. They said their own. They decided they know better. Right? Um, so... Values. That's what we're going to make the yeah, and then I transport my value 20. Previously, yesterday, we transformed all of our expression values of f for every channel. We transformed it using this logical transform. Now, I did my thing, blah, 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 I calculated my MFI, and it's 1.59, but I don't really care. That's the, the logical transform 1.59. So I define an inverse of my logical, right? It will not be the same as their inverse because their logical uses different parameters than I did. So it's important that you define explicitly how is R from now on going to invert the logical, my logical. And then I apply the transformation on this. So in fact, if you want to visualize it a little better, whoops, because I misspelled it. The inverse logical of the logical of 200 is 200. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? You can't always transform back to transformation. What do you mean? Maybe. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you did you drew the four types cluster based on C four C eight K one sixty seven. But if we want to see the expression values for the other markers like C one twenty seven and C three. Then you would have had to include that in flow in flow type. You get we get the cluster cluster on it? Yeah. Um yeah. 
you uh, so the thing is no so the thing is you can do it on your own without full type right um, so you want to see what is the MFI of CD127 for this subpopulation then uh, you would find that subpopulation find the indices right so CD4 uh, flow type doesn't really give you a way to do that oh wait maybe it does no it doesn't sorry <laughs> Uh, I would have to actually do the dirty work that Flowtype is doing for me. So Flowtype then go as far as you wish it had, basically. Is what yeah. Because I guess typically when you have, you would include those in Flowtype typically. Well, not to include the fossil expression of a subtype. Then what you can do is uh, give those to Flowtype and get your MFIs that way, but you don't necessarily, you, you can just ignore the phenotypes that you don't care about, right? They will cluster up. Yes. Oh, no, but they'll but be included, yeah. Okay. They'll be included, so, so yeah, so th let me just clarify this for everyone. So, um, here's all the phenotypes that we've done. If, if we had included C3, uh, it we would have had phenotypes CD3 minus, CD4 minus, CD8 minus, blah, blah, blah. But then we would also have a bunch of phenotypes that don't have CD3 in them at all. So you could, it doesn't hurt to add an extra parameter. It hurts because it slows you down a little bit, more computation. But you can just ignore the phenotypes that have the CD3 afterwards. Like, for example, if you're interested in, uh, for this data set, for example, we were interested in the CD3 positive cells, right, to start with. We started with CD3 positive. We didn't have to do that. We could have let Flowtype do that for us by pretending that we didn't know that we should start with the lymphocytes. We could have just added CD3 as one of the markers. And then in the end, we could have scrolled through and been like, oh, I don't care about all the CD3 negative ones. I'm just going to focus looking at these ones. Or who knows, maybe Flowtype would have found something interesting for the CD3 negative cells that we didn't even think we cared about. Okay, so let's just, um, I'm gonna, so it's, what is it? Time wise, three o'clock. We have a break, and then after the break, I will actually do flow type for about uh, uh. I don't have to do the last two slides, but Yeah, so I don't know if, how that's going to work. How much time can I steal from your slot? So if we return after the break at 3.15, then I can take until maybe 3.45. Is that okay with everyone? And then Ryan's going to shorten his... He's going to speak, speak faster. He was already going to speak really fast. <laughs> he was going to try to finish early, but it's not happening. <laughs> Sorry. OK, I'm going to stop Camtasia. OK, go. So, so far we just applied flow type to just the one flow frame, right? Uh, so for that one flow frame alone, we had all these phenotypes and all these cell counts and MFIs and stuff like that. But only one flow frame is not useful. What we want is to have all these phenotypes, those cell proportions or counts, we want them to be calculated for every single flow frame. Why? What are we going to do with that? Once we have that, we're going to try to se separate the two groups. Yeah. We're going to try to identify which phenotypes have good p values for, for separating between the groups of low survival versus high survival time. So first we have to use FS apply, right? Because we need to apply flow type 
to every single flow frame in our flow set. And for that, we use FS apply, right? So how does FS apply work? We first give it a flow set, and then anything after that is going to be some function that is going to be applied to each frame of the flow set. And here's the function. You give me a fr flow frame X. I'm going to give it to flow type. I'm going to have the same CD4, CD8, KI67. Yeah. Sorry. It's stupid. The function, because it's in the brackets there, is going to give you a flow frame because it's FA supply on the outside. Yes. Sorry. That's exactly correct. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know why you're sorry for being correct. Oh, well, <laughs> you should be proud. They just, they just, you should be saying it's proud. Just, proud. It's just, it's just, no, it's good. It's great that you're following. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, it's a Canadian thing. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, there you go. Welcome. It's just asking, just asking stupid questions about syntax. That's all. You don't care about. It's not stupid, but okay, I will carry on. Sorry, it's not stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to give it the gates just as before. And the marker names so that it knows how to you know name the phenotypes. It's not gonna be the seventh marker plus sixth marker minus, it's gonna be C D four plus C D eight minus. So prop so prop markers is a is a uh, function of flow type or a um, prop markers is a parameter, parameter of flow type, flow yes. Type. Exactly. Yeah. And methods is a parameter of flow type? Yeah. Okay. And marker names. Marker names is a, is a parameter of flow type, flow type. yes. And cell frequencies is a parameter of flow type. No. Cell frequencies is a parameter of Bible body and it is. No. It's a description. It's actually uh, an, an attribute of what the flow type object is. Remember in the virtual box how. This is what flow type returns, right? So in one line, I have added many things, um, which is the, a call to the function flow type with all these parameters that flow type wants. And I'm not going to be returning for each flow frame the cell frequencies and the MFIs and the blah, blah, blah. So I'm only going to work with cell frequencies now. OK? Keep it simple, one thing at a time. I can rerun this and use MFIs instead, but that, that's a whole other workshop. <laughs> Yeah, no, not a whole other workshop, but that, that one you can do on your own time, I'm sure. Okay. And then, because you want it to do for every row, it's n row brackets x. I'm dividing by n row of x. So this is what's happening. For the first flow frame, what's going to happen is flow, flow type is going to be called, given that first flow frame, with all these parameters, it's going to return the flow type object, but I'm only going to be interested in the cell frequencies. But all of those I'm going to divide by the number of cells I have in my flow frame. I don't want the, the cell counts, because remember how this is, what it re this is what it returns. 700 cells. 46 cells in this phenotype. 3,200 3, cells. I would rather have this, where it's 11% of the cells are in CD4 minus CD8 minus, 0.7% are in CD4 minus CD8 minus KI67 plus. I agree with you that it's very, a little bit too much in one line. Um, so you have to read it carefully one piece at a time. And I haven't seen it yet, but as far as I understand, in the newer version of flow type and Archaeoptimix, this stuff should be simplified a little bit. You shouldn't have to specify that many things. Some of these things it should be able to infer on its own, right? It should be able to, uh, I mean, when you give it the flow set, first of all, it should be able to automatically get the its call names, right? Why should you be giving it the flow set and the, the call names? 
Anyways, it's going to be a little bit simpler. It's going to be slightly fewer parameters for you to try to decipher what's going on. But right now you're, you're learning the harder version, tougher version. What is x? Function of x. So for the purposes of this line of code, I am writing my function, uh, which will be applied, because I have this fs apply here, it's going to be applied to each flow frame. So the flow frame that I'm currently working with, I'm going to pretend it's called x, just so I can tell r what to do with x. Yeah. So does it make sense? This is going to return basically my cell proportions. Again, I prefer to annotate my variables as I go so that I don't it doesn't become out of order for me. So just like I, I like to keep the C4, C8, KI67 always there as, an, as a name as opposed to an index, I'm going to name my rows according to the sample names. Right? I just want to keep track of, you know, which every row of uh, when you when you print out flow type, uh, the flow type result, every row corresponds to one patient. So the first pa patient sample name was this this number dot FCS. That was the, the sample name. Um, and then the cell proportion for the CD4 negative CD8 negative uh, phenotype was 13%. The CD4 negative CD8 negative K67 positive was this percentage. Yours may be, slight, may be slightly different because you had maybe slightly different gating than me. Do the, res the, do the entries of this FT object, the flow type object, make sense to you? What is it? It's every row is one patient, and every column is one phenotype, right? And what? The yeah, yeah, sorry, that's what I meant. <laughs> that is the stuff in it, yeah. Just making sure it's hard to keep track of the value that's inherent to the website of the program versus what we assign to the So you have there um, the clock markers, uh, yep. the 764. Yep. Those are referencing columns 764 or the. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh marker is CD4. The sixth marker is CD8. And the fourth marker is KI67. It's so that flow type will know how, what marker order I want. I wanted to first start looking on the CD4 and then start looking on CD8 and then the KI67. Okay, then so my brain is previous to that you talked about naming things naming. that's because flow type wants it like this I didn't make flow type uh. <laughs> <laughs> there um, maybe it will be fixed in the newer version I don't know okay, it's, so, it's, so there is something yeah 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 for sure so we are okay with what flow type represents it's all of our information that we want. Um, what are we going to do with this now? We're going to try to evaluate how well these phenotypes separate the two groups of samples that we have. We have some that have fairly low survival time, some that have fairly high survival time. In fact, let's actually define what we mean by low and high. Remember, though, at some point we had this plot where we um, were gating the live cells, and that was not here. <laughs> Never mind. Remember how that was yesterday, I think. Um, some of the viable cells, the ones that are CD3 positive live, had almost no cells in them. In fact, why don't we check how many cells? Notice how the first one, it has about 6,000 CD3 positive viable cells. Great. This one has 73. This one has only 16 cells. Do we really want to trust the phenotype percentages of 16 cells? Probably not, right? 
So first let's do some quality checks and flag some stuff. This is especially useful when you when this data set has over 400 patients, right? Um, some are bound to have, you know, no live cells, or who knows for what reason. Um, you want to make sure that you don't accidentally give this stuff to flow type and then flow type gets confused because, you know what I mean? You have to make sure you catch the ones that you shouldn't trust. So, here, remove low. Let's remove the low cell count uh, patients. So remember, FS apply viable.fs and row. That gives me what I just did. That gives me all the uh, cell counts. As numeric makes it so that it's uh, not a matrix but a vector, so I can actually do the less than 1,000. So I've decided, just out of the blue, out of thin air, I decided anything that has less than 1,000 cells in it, I'm going to throw away for now, for the purposes of this workshop. Otherwise, I would flag and tell the biologist, here are, these, here are these samples, do you think I should remove them from the analysis, or do you think that they're very important and I should keep them, even though they have low counts? That's, it doesn't work if you're drinking Pepsi or whatever. What do you do? <laughs> so, I have identified the indices of the samples that I have which have low cell counts. Is everyone okay with this? So this isn't... This isn't... Is this, a hmm? this isn't a function, this is a... A variable. A of, it's a variable. Yeah. Yep. It's a which, you know, yep. which. You can even print it out and see what it says. Convince yourself that those were the roles that had, you know, 16, 16 cells in them or whatever. And the minus remove, remove dot like that tells you to subtract it from those roles. Subtract those rows from my um, matrix of, of phenotype F50. proportions. Yeah. So here, uh, I now because I have removed those, I should also remove those same indices from the survival times we have. Remember the survival times were the days that the patient survived. Um, I'm just gonna, just in case I decide to uh, go back on my removal of anything less than a thousand, let, let's say that I run this and then I'm like, mm, maybe, maybe I could add a few more of these, maybe 500. I'm just going to keep track of this variable. This is just for my own purposes. I want to keep track of this variable before I remove the information. Yeah. Good point. I, maybe I should have saved that one. Excellent. Excellent point. <laughs> Now, when you when you look at the values that are saved in survival, I'm actually not even gonna bother with, with looking at it. You guys look at the values saved in survival. So just type survival, enter in your console, look at the values. I personally decided that to define my group of people with low survival, I decided to use the value 1,000 as a cutoff, 1,000 days. Patients that survived less than a thousand days, I'm going to call those as group one, low survival. Patients that survived greater than a thousand days, I'm going to call high survival. Do you agree with my choice of value? For the purposes of this workshop, yes. Hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> no, you can't because you haven't even seen the whole data. The whole data is 466 patients. And I only picked a few. And you, we wouldn't be doing this kind of analysis anyway. It would be doing slightly different. For illustration purposes, <laughs> 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 um, typically you might have, you know, a group of patients that 
has a disease and a group of patients that don't have the disease. So those would kind of define your group one and group two, right? So otherwise, you know, when you, when you, be, when you be faced with a continuous variable, you need to do... Something else. The fancy way of saying is that you have to use the receiver on operating curve and the real way of doing it is you just bunch along and try and try to lots of different cutoffs and choose the one you like. Yep. But in order to use the arc out for the arc optimix plot, we needed two groups. Okay, so now that we have our two groups, we have to come up with some p values. Remember how the arc optimix plot with the red and the blue and the green and the yellow? But those colors are based somehow on, on a p value or some kind of statistical significance estimate. So here's one very straightforward example of how to calculate a p-value just to give it some kind of visualization property. In R, just... I got it. Hi. <laughs> okay. That was cool. That was weird. <laughs> and that was related to OSCR for... <laughs> oh. I love like how they, they looked around and no. yeah. no, they're like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a little creepy, yeah. What do Oh, that's creepy. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I, I apologize. <laughs> it's alright. Okay, so. That was just the NSA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have to define a p value. Here's what, one way to define a p value one p value. Um, a t test of. What does this have? FT. That's the matrix of all of our proportions, phenotypes. Group 1, I'm only taking the rows that belong to the low survival patients. Um, and I'm choosing this phenotype, CD4 negative, CD8 positive. Comma, so the t-test, the function t-test in R, it takes two vectors, x and y. And x has the numbers from one group, y has the numbers from another group, and the t-test tells you are these two different groups or are they kind of the same? That's pretty much what it's what it's doing. So the first entry that I'm giving t-test is the, the proportions of this phenotype, CD4 negative, CD8 positive, for the low survival patients, group one. The second thing that I'm giving in, the second set of numbers, are the proportions of CD4 negative, CD8 positive cells in the high survival group. I'll give you just a moment to play around with that and see what the t-test returns and see that when you take the p-value, p-dot-value attribute of it, it actually gives you the p-value. What is it? It's 87. 0, Yep. Unfortunately. <laughs> Here today, we're <laughs> we're not gonna see anything particularly exciting because we have very few patients and very non-exciting colors. So, dollar sign p dot value is what returns. The p value tells you that it's going to return p value. Yeah, you can delete that, run the thing again, and then see what it gives you. Then you can see. That p, the the t test function it returns some things, including a p value. It also returns some other things. I'm only interested in the p value, but you guys should totally check out what, what how that that works.
that means that you mistyped one of these things. Did you not run something earlier, or? Did you define the groups? Did you define the groups? <coughs> no, do, how about the group one and group two? Oh, group one and group two, yeah, they were fine. The group one group, there was the uh, survival list and the dogs and babies, and group two, the other way around. Oops. Is that what your group one and group two look like? Are those the exact values if you print them out in your console like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah? And FT looks like this. Bunch of numbers. What if you do n row ft? It's because you ran your uh, the command that minuses the low uh, remove low. You ran it twice, so you removed a few extra than you wanted to. Your your ft yeah. So you will, you're gonna have to rerun that. Uh, where you define what FT is to begin with. This is what happened. Uh, because you defined the. Oops, I meant you asked for it to remove cells that had less than 1,000. This line removes some rows, right? It removed that low. What is remove dot low? Yeah, but remove dot low was 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 rows that had less than uh, a thousand. Less, yeah. Less than a thousand so it so I defined that to be that, and those were rows number six, seven, eight, and sixteen. So she removed those rows, but then she ran that line again and removed those rows in the newly defined matrix. But none of those rows would have had less than one thousand. She accidentally ran it twice. Just like when you accidentally log ten your ace and yes, show sure, your sure, sure. logical. <laughs> yeah, so she removed four four rows in this one and then she removed four rows again. That's why she ended up with twelve. Did you rerun it, Suzanne? Yeah, I don't have And now you can you then see if you can recalculate repeat value. Okay. Everyone's okay with this now? Yeah? Good. So that's one p-value, but I want all the p-values. I want them for all the columns of FT, right? This was just for the column that was the phenotype CD4, negative CD8 positive. But I want it for all of the columns now. So I'm going to initialize a vector p-vals to be 1. I'm going to repeat the number 1 the number of columns of my matrix that has all the phenotypes because each column is a phenotype so the number of columns gives me the number of phenotypes. I chose the value 1 this time because p-value of the, the worst possible value I could ever have is 1, right, for p-value. So if something goes wrong and I made a bug and I skipped one phenotype, I don't want to accidentally think that it has a p-value of 0. That would be really great. I would accidentally be misled to think that I found some magical phenotype. So that's why I choose my value to be 1 here, by default. Then I'm going to look through each phenotype. So 1 to the number of columns of FT, the number of columns gives me the number of phenotypes. I want to go through all phenotypes. And this is tricky. First, ignore these three lines, the if and the else thing. Look at just this line. p vals i 
So the I is the phenotype number that I'm at, is the t-test of Ft is my matrix with phenotype proportions. Group 1 is the row, the rows of the low survival patients, group 1. I is the i phenotype. So I'm t-testing this versus this. Is it the same or not, giving the p-value? Does this make sense? Just this one line, does it make sense? Yep. Okay. Ideally, that would be the only thing inside of my for loop. However, a p-value is not defined. It returns an error if you try to compare two things that are identical. So if I give it, here's my, my, my vector x is the values 0, 0, 0, 0. Can you compare those with the values 0, 0, 0, 0? It's going to give me an error. It's going to say this is, because in order for a t-test to be calculated, it calculates the standard deviation of your data. And when the standard deviation is zero, because your values are constant, it tries to divide by zero and unfortunately doesn't handle the error very gently. It just crashes. I didn't write that function, the p-valves, the t-test rather. So for that reason, before I call the t-test, the I'm going to check does SD is a function in R which calculates the standard deviation. Make sense? SD, standard deviation. If the standard deviation of my whole phenotype, that one phenotype just happens to have probably zero cells in all patients. You know, imagine some phenotype with um, some really weird combination of markers that just will never biologically happen ever. So you will have zero cells in that phenotype. There will be no variation in that phenotype between the two groups, of course. And your standard deviation of those phenotype proportions for your whole data will be zero. So if that occurs, then leave my p-value at that spot to be 1. Because I want to say the p-value of this phenotype is 1. 1 is the worst possible p-value we can have. So this one is definitely a bad phenotype to differentiate the two groups. Does that make sense? What you would have done if I hadn't told you this is you would have tried to maybe do the, just this one line that has the integral part of the, the for loop, the p-vals i equals t-test, blah, blah, blah. And then you would have run this, you know, being all excited that it's going to do the right thing, then it's going to suddenly tell you error, something constant, values undefined. And then you would have had to spend some time to reading through the help for the t.test function, which is what I did. You know, This is what I, I actually do. I don't know these things either, the first time I do them. Um, then I read through the help, and then I realized, oh, OK, this must be what's happening. There's no variation, so it's, you know, it can't divide by 0, so it's giving me an error. So I better make sure that I. I don't ask it to do that for, for values where an error is going to occur. So I'm going to try to catch my error scenario and do something meaningful with it. So that's why this is a little bit of a complicated for loop because of that if statement. Next, I want to make sure again that my p-value so I don't accidentally you know, forget which phenotype corresponds to which p-value and I don't want to know like the first phenotype is CD4 or whatever. I, I'm going to just use the names. So I'm naming the p-values to have the same names as the call names of FT, which is the phenotypes. Remember, the columns of FT are the phenotypes. And then you can print out p-values and see you have your p-values, and each p-value is associated with a phenotype. Does everybody have that? Everybody has their p-values? Yours might be slightly different because you're slightly different gating or also, you know, we use the pooled frame for some things and yours was random, so. Okay. We have our p-values, right? Now the next hard thing, our CalpTemix. This is a lot of information for our CalpTemix, so if you don't 
fully comprehend everything, don't worry because it's supposed to be simplified in the next upcoming version. Um, some of this, these things will be sort of automatically generated by default for you. So, I wish that it was already ready so I didn't have to go over this. So Archeoptimix takes in some variables that you must specify and it crashes if you don't. So you have to do it exactly as I have done here. The first uh, variable that it requests, you know how we have all these phenotypes, they're like CD4 minus, CD8 minus, that was the first one I think we had, and then we had CD4 minus, CD8 plus, KI67, blah, blah, blah. Um, this variable signs is actually a way to include where, where do we have the, the minuses and the pluses in this phenotype. We have these three markers and we need a way to tell the computer which phenotype are we looking at. Is it the, we have our three markers, they're always in the same order. Is it the minus minus plus phenotype we're looking at? Is it the plus minus plus phenotype we're looking at? What phenotype? The way that uh, this was programmed was if you have a minus, we use the value 0 to encode that. If you are not using that marker in the same type, we have the value 0 to uh, 1 to encode that. If you are plus, we use the number 2. So the phenotype CD4 minus CD8 minus is going to be 0, 0, 1. 0 meaning CD4 is a negative, that's the first marker. CD8 is negative, another 0. 1 means KI67 is neutral. We're not using it in this future. A little too much, I know. It's it's how it was programmed. Unfortunately, this version of our Captomix requires you to specify this matrix. It doesn't automatically generate it for you. Um, and this is how it's generated, and it's always the same. Uh, this three here is the number of markers that you have. So when you're doing this at home, just look at the uh, help file on our Captomix follow the example word for word and just change it with your information, the number of markers that you have. And you annotate it again just to keep track of things, make sure they're consistent. The row names are just the phenotypes and the column names are, this is our first marker, second marker, third marker. Let's move on. I'm not even going to ask you if I understood that because it doesn't matter. It's something you must supply and you just can copy and paste it without attempting to have any deep understanding about it. That's the first thing you must apply. Then you must apply, this is the important part, some kind of statistical measure which will tell Archaeoptimix how to go about coloring those plots and making those arrow thicknesses. We have, we have already co uh, computed our p-values, right? That's what we're going to use for significance. You know how the lower the p-value is, the better? But, you know, when you're coloring things, you want it, like, the higher the number is, the higher the score is, you know? So, instead of going lower by p-value, I want to go high. So, taking the negative log 10 of the p-value does that. It doesn't have to be the negative log 10. It could be, um, you could define it however you want. But this, just use this. It's, it's a standard way. So, for example, if your p-value is 0 0.01, the log 10 of that is negative 2. And that's why I put the negative, so that now it's 2. Does that make sense? Uh, if it doesn't make sense, print the p-values, and then print the negative log 10 of the p-values, and convince yourself that it corresponds to the lower the p-value the better, but now the higher the negative log 10 of the p-value the better. What Archaeoptimix does is it creates this like complicated tree of you know the, the phenotypes, how they you know you go from starting with no phenotype to going to C4 and then adding another marker, C8, and then another third marker, but then 
I mean, negative and so on. It's a really, really huge tree. And if you looked at the whole thing, you would not make any sense of it whatsoever because it would be way too many things. Especially when you have 13 colors. If you were trying to look at every possible phenotype in one plot, you would not be able to see anything. So Archaeoptimix tries to get rid of the ones that don't really matter so much. All, all the phenotypes that have such a high p-value, like why are we going to look at them? Kind of tries to hide them in a smart way. And so the start phenotype, it's uh, the one that's going to be at the very bottom of the tree, where it's one that you have noticed has a fairly low p-value, and you want to make sure that no matter what, Archaeoptimix doesn't accidentally ignore some high p-value phenotype just before that one and then miss this one that you know is important. It's just one way of trimming the tree so that you don't look at a ginormous tree but you look at just one. I believe this part will also be optimized, I don't know, in the new version. And So what does 0, 1, 2 mean? You can, uh, there's a function in R called sort, and it sorts things for you. So if you, if, if you wanted to kind of read through the first few p-values that were the smallest ones, you could just do sort p-values and then could just kind of read them. Okay, the smallest one is 0 0.11. That's pretty bad, right? But for today, that's <laughs> <laughs> with so few samples, that's what you can expect. With so few colors, that's what you expect. And especially for me with my crap gating, not exact gating, right? That's what you expect. You expect the p-value to be not amazing. So this is my lowest p-value, and this is the phenotype that it corresponds to. Is it worse? Yeah, yeah. It's like with trying to gating, I've proved that there's no doubt. No. Who knows where it diverged? Anyways, it, it, this would on this yeah. It then maybe the case is that like uh, Ryan gave an example of some data. What was the data set that you said? The Parkinson's. There maybe there's nothing interesting in this data. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that's the case because I have selected very few patients and removed most of the interesting colors, probably by accident. So. Um, Here's one way you can show that there's nothing going on. Um, so this this phenotype here, CD4 negative, KI67 positive, for me, that's the one that had the lowest p-value. And I want to tell Archaeoptimix that when you're creating this tree, please include this one. I want to see it somewhere in there. It would be, it, it, it's, I know it's important because of the p-values. And so I'm giving you a hint to please use that one. So what did I say it is? CD4 negative. There's no CD8, K67 positive. So CD4 negative, the code for negative is 0. Here it is. CD8 is missing. The code for missing is 1, neutral. There's, there's no CD8 negative or positive. It's just not there, not, not using it. K67 positive, the code for plus is 2. So this is what I have done here. Then I have looked at a couple of other uh, sort of interesting looking maybe phenotypes and I have included them as well in these other Archaeoptimix trees, tree-like structures, you know. And then you can merge these trees into one because a lot of them are going to have overlap, right? Some phenotypes are going to be common to all these trees. You don't want to be looking at three of them when you could just combine them and it will combine it in the best way possible so that you can just simply look at it without looking at double information. Do you need to have start for your type in all three lines? Sorry? Do you need to have the start for your type um, parameter? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you don't, it won't be very interesting, I think, for this data set. You can try it without. Okay. For here, you probably will not see anything particularly interesting for this data. But for yours, you can try without, and it will autom automatically try to, to find the best ones. 
and again, in the new version, it's going to be easier to set the parameters and hopefully more um, intuitive. So keep that in mind. Now, the, the way to uh, save your or view and save your plot. So, so here's, uh, Stephen, what you were asking about, how to save a, an image in R. Uh, you can do, R has this function, PDF, which basically tells the computer to start creating a PDF document. It doesn't actually open it up and plot it for you, just the computer is plotting it on the inside. And you give it the file name that you want it to write the information to. And then you create your plot. So plot merged is going to know that this merged thing is some kind of Archaeoptimix object. And it's going to use the plot function supplied by the Archaeoptimix package. It's going to know how to plot it. But in order for, you, for, for it to use the, the, the coloring, you supply the negative log 10 p values. It's going to print them as a color bar and use them to color the plot. Now, to tell R that you're done plotting and it should finish writing the PDF file and not wait for another plot, you do dev dot off device off. Turn off the PDF device. Whatever little thing the computer is using on the inside to create this PDF document, you can tell it that we're done plotting. Now look at where I have saved it and the virtual box, go to that folder and open up your, you can open up the file. Did you see what I did? I went to the folder in the virtual box. I went to, you know, documents, workshop, and right here is where you should see a PDF file. Does everybody have a PDF file? I chose my starting phenotypes, you know, the 012, 002, whatever. Does yours look different? Oh, okay, good. Uh, I chose my starting phenotype so that it will look pretty. Your guys, can I see what yours looks like? Oh, can I see? Yeah. Oh, cool. So really, really, very, you know, Yeah, 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 okay. So, so for you, this this was much better than just K67 alone. Whereas for me, it was essentially kind of the same. <laughs> yeah, it's not very good. <laughs> I agree. Uh, so how, how does one interpret this plot? Remember, we're looking at this. The higher the number is, the better the phenotype is, right? The more red, the better. What does this say at the top? All cells. What, what phenotype is that? No phenotype. Just all the cells. And we're looking at proportions. So these are all 100%, 100%, 100%. This has a p-value, or the uh, score of zero, because you can't predict anything when you know nothing. If we only looked at CD4 negative proportions, still not, not very good. It's light blue. It's not particularly informative. If I was designing a panel for this, I would say don't. Uh, CD4 alone is not sufficient, clearly. KI67 alone might be sufficient even, because it looks fairly high. It looks almost, this is the highest one, the best phenotype, but KI67 alone to me, for my data, for my gating, looks like it might actually be enough. Going from CD4 to adding KI67 improves the predictive ability of that phenotype significantly. That's why the arrow is so thick. Adding an additional marker, C8, decreases it. So it seems like C8 is adds enough randomness to, to my, my data that it actually makes things worse. So I'm better off just checking these proportions. 
when I'm looking at this, I would say pick one or two phenotypes that look like they might be fairly interesting. N not one or two. You would you would normally have way more markers, so you would have like five interesting phenotypes at least. Um, try to pick ones that have significantly different markers. Like I would maybe pick out see, this one and this one, although the the common theme is Ki67, so it, it's not particularly interesting here, but. Pick out a few of the significant looking phenotypes, go and um, manually gate those and confirm those are real interesting phenotypes and make your conclusions accordingly. Make sense? And I think I will stop there. Oh, that's um, how does one output the p values? Sorry, the uh, by looking at them, the phenotypes. Oh, so they were they were you were you worried about the values? So what output can be just um, it's just higher hierarchically organized and based on the p values. Yeah. Yes, uh, I forgot to mention one other thing that I did here is. I actually uh, saved my results as an Excel spreadsheet in case you were going to do something else with it. And you can you can just do a question mark, write that CSV on your own and see what, what happened there. And you can also see it in the virtual uh, machine if you open the folder. The same place where that archi.pdf file was saved, results.csv, comma separated value file. When you open that up, make sure that it's separated by comma. You can, you know, share your, or do whatever else you want to do with these numbers later. Uh, using Excel, you can plot them, whatever you want to do. So, FT was, remember FT is my, right after the dev.off function, I have a few more lines of code. Um, FT was my matrix that had all my phenotype percentages. I use the rbind function to add another row to that matrix, which also will store the p-values in there. I don't want to lose those. And then basically write.csv, you give it a matrix, I call the matrix results, and then you put comma, file equals, and you just give it a path, the, an exact file name, including the full path where you want the csv to be written. Okay, yes? You can, or uh, you can, if you have more interesting that, to be honest with you, I did this because it wasn't going to look interesting otherwise. But you can try with not specifying any phenotypes, and if that's not giving you what you, you're, you know, enough information, you feel like there should be more, then you can try to specify. And yeah, you can only merge two at a time. So you can without specifying this without Yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah, you would merge them two at a time, and then two of the merged, and then the third merged. Okay. 